Hello again, friends! And you are our friends, and welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through right here on another... Uh, it's almost Summer's Day. It's still spring, wherever you may be, as we are recording. This is also going really bad so far. I'm your host, the great Brian Last. We got reviews, and uh, maybe not too much more this week, but here he is. The reviewer himself, the leader of the cult of Cornette, the legendary Mr. Jim Cornette. Well, you've almost deafened me as soon as you said hello, and I've got to correct you in one thing, Brian, that apparent in Australia, New Zealand, and like the, the point on the other side, of, isn't it fall now? Don't they do the thing around the the other side of the, the dark side of the moon or something? So it's not spring everywhere, but it's it feels like summer. So let's just not worry about the weather or the season. And And, and please try to talk just a little more softly uh, when you burst in with it, because I'm, I'm, I want to apologize at the top of the program because foolishly this morning I tried to blow my nose and my right ear also squished. And you know, you know, Brian, you and I talk about our various hearing issues. Yours has ma manifested itself in some kind of supersonic hearing where you can detect the hummingbird's heartbeat and, 50 paces, and I can barely hear it thunder out of my right ear. I got to degum tinnitus from, yeah, I made it through all those years in the WWF with the pyro era, and I didn't have hearing problems. And I go to TNA in Orlando, where they tried to make up for shooting TV in a warehouse by blowing off a goddamn mortar shell every 15 minutes, and it gave me ten ringing and squishing and things, and now I either I, I'm echoing in my head when I'm not wearing the headset, and so I feel like I'm either doing the Chris Jericho two feet away from your face going, hi guys, how are you? Or possibly the NPR thing where I'm talking like, because I can't fucking tell. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, right before we started recording this, you heard an, a, a vibration in the background and had to search your house to investigate and found that a bathroom fan was on in the floor above you. While meanwhile, I'm down here trying to goddamn figure out how to turn the volume in my headphones up past 100%. It don't work. So anyway, we I apologize if I don't sound right. Well, you should be apologizing every week then. Hey, that, I didn't I didn't I don't mean sound pleasing or sound you know of of enter, entertaining to some people, but at least at least I'm always right. I normally sound right and I am right. It's just some people don't like people being right. It's a dictator song. I am right. You know, did you ever, you've seen the pictures. That was what George Crybaby Cannon had written across the back of his jacket when he was the manager of the Fabulous Kangaroos. And he'd turn his back on the camera and it just said in big letters, I am right. Did you see much of him as a manager? Um, When I first started, he was here. In uh, in the Tennessee Territory, when I first started, I had just found wrestling, like 72, 73-ish, and managed, um, the, not only, he was not only here with the Kangaroos at various points, but also the Mighty Yankees at one point before Sir Clements. I mean, that was the thing, Nick Goulas, when he controlled everything, even though Jarrett was booking the, the Memphis end at that point, they always had like six or eight heel tag teams in the territory overall in Knoxville in and Birmingham and Nashville and Memphis in and, and every heel tag team had a manager. So at, at some point in that early seventies run and the houses were so big, Louisville had just started filling up doing 5,000 people a week sometimes. And Birmingham was doing well. Memphis was setting records at the Coliseum. Uh, what did I not mention? Chattanooga. 
So they would just cycle all those heel teams through. You can go back and look at the... I didn't get to see all of it, obviously, then. I was just on fascinated with what was going on in Louisville because I thought that was, that was it, except a tape from Memphis. But when you go back and look at all the records that Mark James and Scott Teal and all those, you know, so many people have done uh, compiling the Tennessee Territory records, it's amazing the number of guys they had. They were running five towns a fucking night amongst those three, or, no, maybe six sometimes amongst those three ends of the territory. What was the question? George Cannon is a manager. Oh, yes. And uh, and he was, uh, for the time, he was excellent. I don't know if it would work now from what I remember, but I'm not an expert. And then I saw more of him later on, actually, as the TV announcer for right. uh, Superstars of Wrestling when an early independent in Ontario that he, you know, right at the VHS era. When so you, with it, when you say he was excellent, do you mean on the mic or working ringside? No, I'm, I didn't mean he was, he was excellent, but I mean, he, he was, he was good on the mic. He, he had also been a wrestler and continued to work, but he was just so fucking huge. Right. But the, the, the crying thing as I remember, it may be a little over the top for today's audience from a guy that looked like that at the same time. It worked then because everybody, they believed in the people that they were seeing. And now I'm not sure it would work now because he would fucking blubber. But nevertheless, um, before we go any further with the show today, we want to explain we're, we're a day late because of a variety of commitments that we both had, but also it was, I get what, maybe 36 hours ago now that Brian, you got the news that a friend of both of ours, uh, Scott Cornish, who has been, you know, featured many times on the 605 super podcast. And we've mentioned on the show here and have both known for 30 years had, had passed away. And it was, um, it was it was not a it was a sudden thing it wasn't expected because he hadn't been you know ill for a long time but we understand the last week he caught covid and complications from that and you reminded me i kind of thought that but you told me for sure right before we went on the air that even though he's become one of your best friends throughout the last 30 years, you guys actually met at Fan Week at Smoky Mountain uh, the same year that I met you. Yeah. Smoky Mountain Wrestling Fan Week, if you ever, you know, I'm talking to you, the person who actually put it together, well, you know, with respect to Brian Hildebrand, you created a lot of friendships. You put a lot of us together, the self-anointed smart fans from around the country, around the world in some cases, and created friendships. And I met you when I met Scott Cornish. And I've been friends with both of you 30 years. I met Stacy, your wife, before she was your wife. Yes. At Smoky Mountain Wrestling Fan Week. I met, you know, someone who's not with us anymore, but I think of, because me and Scott were both really good friends with him, Harry White at Fan Week. John McAdam, who does his show on Arcadian Vanguard. I met him at Fan Week. I met people, Dave Lane, who's still out there. I just saw him on Twitter. Great photographer. I met him at Fan Week. There are so many of us who met there that have retained a special bond and a friendship. And like you said, with Scott, one of my best friends, someone who's a major influence on me and everything I like, music and books and movies and comedy and, and humor, a lot of it just comes from long conversations on the phone with him. We used to do that, conversations on the phone for hours and hours and hours and correspondence via letter. You know, and eventually, you know, on the computer talking back and forth. But I've had so many adventures with him in wrestling and so many in music. I went to see, with him, I went to see Iggy and the Stooges. I went to see Hazel Atkins with the Demolition Doll Rods and American Death Ray. I went to see the Dictators, who I mentioned before, with the Star Spangles opening up for them. I saw Question Mark and the Mysterians at Lincoln Center. No. Yeah. 
at Lincoln Center. I mean, it was bizarre. The way he was dressed was bizarre, Mr. Question Mark himself. But that was the kind of friend Scott was. When I would go down to the East Village, I'd take the train from Long Beach. He would come down from upstate New York. And we'd go to the 2nd Avenue Deli. We'd go buy some zines. And we'd just have a good time. And, you know, I'm, I'm doing my best to just be upbeat right now. Because I've been so down and I've cried my eyes out the last couple of days. Because it was sudden. He caught COVID. He was just out doing what he always does. Going to shows. He didn't have a car. He didn't drive. And he found a way to go everywhere. For wrestling, for music, for comedy. It, it was incredible. And, you know, he always was great at having stories and telling them in the funniest way. I never got to go to OVW, but he did with Greg Greenland. And I would hear all about the stories from when they would go down there. Yeah, they, they would come to... Well, I said there was a picture posted on Twitter, I believe, somewhere. Uh, of him standing in front of the old Davis Arena over in Jeffersonville. And he, and Greg used to come to a lot of the Six Flags events we do outdoors, and Scott came to some of those. And, you know, it, it, I, I honestly, until you said that, did not know that he didn't drive at all. But he was, he was everywhere. He was like teleported from place to place because you he, he would always see him popping up. He was very devoted. He was in Amarillo with me, me, him, Bob Barnett, and Harry White in a car driving to Terry Funk's ranch. I mean, he was someone who went everywhere and did so many different things. And, you know, the friendship he had with me, it's amazing seeing since he passed just a couple of days on his Facebook page, so many of his friends from his other worlds have been posting tributes, and it's amazing just how many people he affected. A positive energy, always hysterical, and a very giving friend. I have here, I posted some of these, Jim. You may get a kick out of some of them. In the old days, kids, we used to trade tapes. And with the tapes, sometimes you would send a letter. Imagine that. Sometimes the letter would be bland. Here's what I sent you. Please send me this. Other times you would get some humor out of it. And Scott was good with that. Let me read you a couple of these, Jim. This is actually from the end of one. This is right after WCW Uncensored in 1996. Late breaking news. Hulk Hogan's next five hand-picked opponents from the Dungeon of Doom. One, Ted Arcidi. Two, Curly Moe. Three, Uncle Elmer. Dead <laughs> four years now and still a better wrestler than Jeep Swenson. Four... Ed Leslie's latest incarnation, a shoot angle as the untalented suck ass. And five, Bill Kazmaier, what you gonna do? <laughs> and then here's another one. I'll read you this one. You may get a kick out of it. Uh, he sent me VHS tape of The Young Ones, which was a British comedy I always was a big fan of. It used to be on MTV. Uh, people in England are always shocked anyone here knows it. It was on MTV, and then it was on videotape, a cult favorite. Brian. I know how much you enjoy the young ones, just like Jerry Lawler. So here oh, you go. Oh, oh, oh. oh geez. So oh, here, that was stiff. So here you go. These are two of the, I believe, four volumes released so far. I haven't seen these in years since they first aired in this country on MTV. Enjoy. Thanks for the great mixtapes. Some wild, wacky stuff. If you do another one, you might include one Brody Luger cage match. I really want to see this, even if the quality isn't top-notch. Just to see it, you know? Two, Missy Hyatt porn video. Same reason. Three... Now, now wait, wait, we, we have to say that that was later uh, uh, proven to be uh, a rumor, correct? To not get sued or something? He just, I'm just reading what was written here. I'm not... Oh, I thought, I thought, I thought... Uh, there was at one time there, there was, was a, a rumor that, that that's what was. prompted this. All right, now I'm going to stop for a second. I had the master tape, I believe, of Brody Luger, the cage match that became famous because Brody stopped cooperating with Luger right before he yes. worked for Crockett. The Missy Hyatt porn video was a rumor that went around in '97, I want to say, because Missy was living in Manhattan, and around that period of time. I forget the name of the channel because I didn't live in Manhattan, but I spent a lot of time there. Uh, but the public access channel had like porno programming, Robin Bird and various things. And there was a video of two women 
nude, going at it, and the rumor was it was Missy Hyatt. And I may have procured a copy of the tape. <laughs> and the quality sucks, so there was no... I couldn't tell, to be honest with you. It could be, it couldn't be. I'm still, to this day, not certain, but if she says it wasn't her, I'll believe her. Because I, I couldn't figure it out. Well, there you go. And, and it, after intensive study, you That's couldn't... Right. Okay. Uh, three, the Flair Lawler Jimmy Hart WMC Challenge Angle. I'm not sure whether I've ever seen this, but I've sure heard about it. And by the way, I had a copy of that I got from you. Thank you very much. You're welcome even less. Four, Terry Funk's Chainsaw Interview. And five, Canvas Cavity Highlights. Who says I'm <laughs> sick? Hey, it looks like the Sportatorium isn't closing after all. Let's go. The big Christmas night card features the returning Killer Brooks versus Frogman LeBlanc in a cage match <laughs> with the goon as special referee. If LeBlanc wins, he gets five minutes with Baboose. <laughs> also, also a big $35 battle royal Black Bart versus Bob Sweetan's ghost and Sebastian is rumored to be making a surprise appearance selling programs talk to you soon Scott Cornish check out my new website www.lanosadick.com <laughs> <laughs> And, so, and folks, I apologize if you've just wandered by this program in the last couple of weeks, but these names are from our past are just hilarious to us. He sent one here, too. This is the last one I'll uh, read on the air. But it was uh, after I sent him the Heroes of World Class documentary. He wrote, Mickey Grant invented everything. <laughs> but then he sent a copy of, uh, I'm guessing this, if it's not ICW, it must be ICW. I was going to say it would be the precursor in Knoxville. It's a card that has a challenge match, and he wrote the best stip ever. Ronnie Garvin puts up $5,000 versus Don Diamond, who puts up a Barry Manilow album if he shows up. <laughs> best stipulation ever. Five grand versus a Barry uh, Manilow album. Because <laughs> if it, 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 Don Diamond, if, if, if he had had long, fluffy, flowing blonde hair instead of that kind of curly... Perm. nondescript head of hair that he had you would have thought that he was Barry Manilow except if he would have sang then you wouldn't have thought that oh I didn't even put two and two together about that the resemblance now that you oh, say that, it I yes, totally see look, it yes it, it, you look dead like him if you put a Man, Barry Manilow wig on Don Diamond you'd have Barry Manilow but nobody knows now what the fuck Don Diamond looks like so it wouldn't be funny yeah, his career never really took off past a certain point but... oh it, it took off alright it took about 35 years off <laughs> but <laughs> but this is the kind of stuff he would send me and again you know just a wonderful friendship over 30 years and i'm very very happy i guess one of the things i'm grateful for is that since i started having him come on the 605 super podcast in 2016 he developed the following he developed people who enjoyed him and his humor the way i did and he made a lot of friends through the show and that's one of the things i'm always proudest of with 605 and with the cult of cornet the amount of people who had never met each other very similar to what you did with fan week people who had never met each other who somehow and in this case online developed friendships through the programs through the shows through the community and that's one of the things i'm really proud of yeah the shows are really successful but there's people who have best friends right now because of the show and like I said, everyone's feeling it. Everyone who knew him, the amount of people who only heard him and know how much he meant to everyone who have reached out has been tremendous and lovely guy. One of the best friends I've ever had. And, and I'm going to miss him tremendously. And his, his input into things was something I always wanted because he had the most interesting takes and views on things. And it always made me laugh, but tremendous guy. And, uh, everyone, uh, you know, anyone who ever heard him, please think of something he said that made you laugh. And uh, again, he was, uh, I think, did you say 63? 64, I believe, 64. but I got to double check. 64, and, and he might appreciate this because I, I, you said that before we started recording. You said, well, yeah, I've no, I met you, meaning me, at the exact same time that I met Scott. And me and Scott are both, I'm going to be 63 this year. We're both about the same age. I said, I hope you're not like a fucking nursing home cat. <laughs> what does that mean? I and still you don't said, know what, what that does that means. mean? No, the, the legend 
of the and there's been more than one but you hear the stories of of the cat at the nursing home that goes and curls up next to the next of the old folks to go and they can predict these things and they're comforting them in their last moments or whatever i hope you're not a nursing home cat i hope so too that sounds awful you know it's funny i just thought of something i knew who he was before i went to fan week because I had seen some of the videos coming out of 93 Fan Week, the first one, and there was a series of mock promos leading to a press conference to build up J.R. Benson versus Dr. Tom Pritchard. Yes, yes. In an electrified, no-rope, barbed wire, over a bed of infected hypodermic needles match with the loser having to spend 48 hours with Dr. Mike Leno. Yes, I remember. I remember that. I remember that shoot. Harry White did a promo, and Dave Meltzer actually walks on and hands him a piece of paper and walks out, and he goes, this just in the Observer, lifting five stars, seven and a half stars for this match, <laughs> which all things considered is funny, but they're doing this mock press conference, and it's J.R. Benson with Kevin Lawler, and it's Tom Pritchard or Chris Candido, and they start taking questions from the audience, which are all the other fans, you know, the smart fans, whatever there were, 30 people. And Scott just out of nowhere, and I always remember that he raised his hand, everyone's like making noise, and everyone gets quiet. He goes, Dr. Pritchard, Dr. Pritchard. And everyone doesn't know what he's going to say. This wasn't planned. He goes, and this is the summer of 93, Luger Yokozuna. Dr. Pritchard, what about the commission ruling you're going to have to wear a protective pad over the steel plate in your head? <laughs> and, <laughs> and you can tell Tom Pritchard had no idea how to answer that, and the room broke up. It was such a brilliant, smart, funny, quick thing. And, uh... Yeah, I'm really going to miss him. Greatest guy. Just the greatest guy. Big influence on me and who I am. So, Scott, we've got you to blame for much of this. Got you to blame, too. So, Well, hey, I, I, was, I wasn't even there. <laughs> no, but... Um, he was with me in yes. Louisville in 95 for the, uh, the famous riot. The last great night of kayfabe in Louisville when... The yeah. fans decided they wanted to beat us up because they couldn't beat up the wrestlers. <laughs> See, he, he could get more heat than anybody. We got out of there in time, but nevertheless. Um, but w yes, we will miss Scott. And that's, again, something sudden and shocking. So, But yes, as, as we said, we're going to miss Scott and, and his contributions to and and. You know, the, the, the community, and, and it's not like something, again, that we were prepared for because it was so sudden, so it's, you know, kind of a shock with that. But can I give you some positive news that we've done something good as a community for some people? Positive news? Are you getting out of showbiz? Oh, come on now, Henny Youngman. What the fuck here? <laughs> and no, the, uh, the action figures that went on sale last weekend... June the 1st, whenever you're hearing this, was last weekend. Uh, the bloody variant and the raw debut variant of me at jimcornet.com. The bloody variant sold out in the first day. I believe there are 40 or less raw variants left available. However, point is, since we've sold almost all of them out and I haven't even got today's update, I am not only going to contribute the ten dollars per figure sold that we promised to the crusade for children but i'm going to go ahead and kick in the extra thousand dollars so babe we're rounding off at five thousand dollars and the total because the last time we recorded the crusade was still ongoing but the final total was 5.7 million dollars we i was hoping for i think they did six two last year but $5.7 million for the special needs kids in Kentucky and Southern Indiana and the Pleasure Ridge Park Fire Department, they're always number one. They raised alone a quarter of a million dollars. They were the number one fire department. And I think Louisville Gas and Electric and their employees came up with something like four hundred grand. So anyway... But the cult of Cornette came up with $5,000 rounded off that we are contributing. And uh, they'll, they'll total that on next year's crusade by the time I write this check. Imagine how much more they would raise if you would go on their show. 
Well, I was thinking about doing a dunking booth or a pie in the face kind of tennis thing or I, you know, they said the, the the most profitable enterprise would be kick cornet and the balls, but I don't know if I want to sell that many fucking tickets in one day for that. Eesh. But anyway, uh, but yeah, so the, <clears throat> and as I said, if you hurry now, hurry now, that's for a limited time only. There's very few raw ver- debut variants left, but also the regular supply of fine merchandise at jimcornette.com including the midnight express and heavenly bodies action figures the cult of cornet certificates dvds books photos and so much more are available at jimcornette.com and i do have and this will be announced later on in the year one more as i've mentioned before debut or debut one more variant of me, not deviant, but variant. Yeah, it's the one that me. was the cheapest to make, the nude Jim Cornette figure. And no, no, it's going to be, it's going to be clothed. There's, there's clothes on this. They didn't have enough plastic to make me anatomically correct. It would have cost too much money. <laughs> but anyway, there's, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. You make a special mold that big, it's, it's going to cause trouble. But uh, there's going to be one more later on this year that I've already mentioned, and the details are still to come because we're doing one thing at a time here, folks. But I, it, it, Brian, I was remarking to you about this the other day that I've got these figures that I've been selling and continuing selling, but now suddenly everybody and their brother wants to make an action figure of me in some fashion or form. And uh, how how much is it racist now? When I was a kid, they would say, "How much rice can a Chinaman eat?" I guess that's a that's not something you say these days. But how many fucking figures can even the cult of Cornette possibly want, for heaven's sake? And and it's also you know, there's one fucking numb nuts. I don't know who he, I don't know who these people are. But he was, oh, we can do better figures for you than this other guy's figures or whatever, knocking uh, my toy company. And uh, they don't understand that we're doing, thanks to the blessedness of the cult of Cornette, we love you all. We're doing fucking quantities of these things, even when they're limited quantity. It's still quantity more than these fucking guys with their own company with Keebler elves working out of their basements can supply to me in my lifetime. The the Midnight Express four pack was limited to 2000. And by the way, folks, there are probably 300 and something available. So remember Christmas is coming, but that was four of that's 8,000 figures alone. In a custom design display box, et cetera, et cetera. Why do these people think they can do this out of their goddamn garage? Well, I'll say this. You are, from what everyone tells me, and I know a lot of the guys who do toys, and they're good guys, you are the most requested person by far for different styles of toys, different things. And everyone is pretty respectful when they reach out and say, if Jim ever changes his mind or does anything different, please keep us in mind. However, for people to make a bizarre plea to work with you and in the process be obnoxious, insult what you're already doing, act like they can get you deals that you could get on your own, not understanding that you probably sell more than they ever would, it's just, it's ridiculous. And uh, I think we could probably rule out one person you're ever going to work, or one group that you're ever going to work with. Oh, oh. This this one particular jack off, I th- believe I mentioned to you that if I was a disembodied head in a jar of formaldehyde, and he was the only one that could make me a body, I'd stick with the fucking formaldehyde. Just remember, folks, when you're trying to do business with people, how you conduct yourself is important. How you present yourself is important, especially if someone has no idea who the fuck you are, as Jim does with most of these people. <laughs> but it's important, no matter what business you're in, if you want to do a deal or you want to at least open the door to a deal, don't be an asshole. So that's, uh, I guess that's the message here. 
But this is your program, oh great one, and it's time that we crack down or knuckle down or kneel down or bend over or whatever we got to do to to lift heaven and earth to make the folks happy out there in podcast land and, and go over the world of wrestling as only we do. Well, again, there's a lot of things to talk about this week. We're going to talk about AEW Dynamite. We're going to talk about Tony Khan's nutty behavior on Twitter. We're going to talk about who killed WCW, which I keep calling the death of WCW because I remember the book. But before we get to your thoughts on Raw, Jim, why don't we let the listeners know, maybe they're as hungry as I am right now. I haven't had breakfast. I'm starving. Oh. And I'm thinking about our sponsor, and I'm getting more hungry by the moment. Well, you know what? You know, I uh, people wonder why I like the old days so much back in the day, back in my time. That's when people ate steak and eggs for breakfast. You remember that? Give me out order of steak and eggs when they'd walk in the diner with the fucking fedora hat and there'd f- be fucking Lauren Bacall behind the goddamn sling in the fucking hash. I'll tell you what. Lauren Bacall. Folks, you could eat. Oh, well, there you go. You could eat just whistle, but you can whistle for steak on any meal of the day, folks. <laughs> just whistle and just say, bring me some steak. Well, my, my lips are dry. So that that means I need some steak sauce, and you can get all these things and more from our friends at Omaha Steaks. And Father's Day. Father's Day is almost here, and I'll tell you what, if if you have admitted to being the procreator of a a little little baby or babies in the world, then you qualify as a father. You don't have to be currently in the family. So anybody that you've (laughs) spermed, or spawned i should say what are you saying i don't know what you're saying here. what i'm trying to say is everybody (laughs) has a father right sperm everybody has a father but sometimes you i think you should get some guy should get like eight father's day packages because not only has he got some in the family but also he's probably there's a few he's probably not even been accused of just go ahead and get every guy in the whole neighborhood Father's Day packages from Omaha Steaks. You'll have everybody covered. Everybody wants to eat steak. And gift packages are starting at just $99, folks, for the incredible premium proteins like the juicy pork chops, the air-chilled chicken, the beefy burgers, and, of course, the main course, the Omaha Steaks. They got the sirloins. They got the bacon-wrapped filet. They got all kinds of stuff. All the cuts they what part of the cow do they not use over there at Omaha Steaks, Brian? The ears. They don't use the ears. But I'll tell you what, you need to keep your ears open for good deals like this, and we can get you $10 off. If you go to omahasteaks.com right now and order the mouthwatering gift packages for Father's Day or any day that Dad wants steak, That started just $99. As a bonus, use the promo code JCE. You're going to get $10 off your order. So once again, how can you beat that? Now you're down to $89, and you never know what can happen from there. Sooner or later, somebody in your family or social circle is going to need to eat. Doesn't even need to be your father. You're going to starve your mother to death? What kind of person... It's not going to want to feed their mother. Well, even if you're buying it for your dad, there's so much food he's going to probably want to cook it and share it with the rest of the family. Well, maybe he lives alone. Maybe he's he's off in the woods somewhere. Maybe the family has driven him to something like this. You're trying to make up to him somehow. So right. you can't just assume he might be going to just stick all this food in his own gullet. He may have a tough time getting it delivered if he's off in the woods somewhere. Well, he, he could be up in a high-rise condominium. And, and you know, he could still be al- living alone. Maybe mom found somebody else. Maybe she got some different cuts of meat. So you never know. You can just spread the packages all around, folks. Gift packages starting at just $99. And when you use the promo code JCE at checkout, you're going to get $10 off your order. I don't know what how how much more we can do to feed America. It's a good time too. It's barbecue season. Well, and there you go. So then, it, well, now and here's the thing though: Dad's going to have to barbecue it. He'll probably insist. Most most dads want to do the barbecuing, 
But that's another way to get, get one over on the old fart. You get him the meat, but then he has to go out and cook it for everybody. You're sitting back, lazy asses, just eating it. Well, fuck you for Father's Day, Dad. Cook dinner. That kind of... See, see how these people are? What, what do you mean, these people? Well, these fucking families out here that are making poor Dad cook fucking dinner on Father's Day. All right, well... Just like on Father's Day, there's a lawnmower somewhere in the background. <laughs> Omaha Steaks, promo code JCE for delicious, juicy steaks. Mouth-watering yes. steaks. Mouth-watering, yes. Every time you eat something from Omaha Steaks for the next day or two, you're just fucking slobbering all over yourself. I don't know how they do it. Hey, Jim, I said we were going to go to Raw, but I'm just seeing something that uh, one of the members of the Cult of Cornet sent to the Facebook group. Uh-oh. Interesting thing here. No, no, nothing bad, but interesting. I hadn't heard this. But let's talk about this real quick. Interesting topic. Jose, the assistant on Twitter put out, I guess he originally wrote this in 2023 and then he put it again now that they're feuding. MJF gave Roosh a briefcase full of money on national TV. And that week, people in Mexico were looking to find out where he lived to steal the money. And he wrote, now, oh, I think this is relevant now. Roosh had to move houses because of MJF. True story. Looking forward to the match. And I guess he also said here, I'm reading one of the quotes. Roosh had to move into a gated community for protection after the angle where MJF gave him a briefcase full of cash on TV. <sighs> That's an interesting kayfabe story. Hey, you okay. Know. What? <clears throat> well, now in, in, in what... In what context is, is he saying this? This is a, he's kayfabing and he's following the the program that they're doing, and and this is not true. But he's trying to present it as a shoot, like the 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 kids do these days. Or is is this actually alleged to be a true story in actual fact? Well, remember, we had heard that he had been laid off, or I don't know if that's the proper term, he had been released from AEW, so I don't know if he's still there, so I don't think he has any reason to, if he isn't there, he has no reason to protect them with the story, but... Well, he could be Rush's friend and just wanting to help the the cause along, but I mean, it because here's the problem I have with believing it, is, okay, let's say that... So the, the story is that the fans or someone who knew Rush in Mexico saw on television that MJF gave him a briefcase full of cash in whatever town that AEW was in doing that TV show that night. And they, because of that, were coming to Rush's house a week later, two weeks later, However, until the point where he said, I have to move to steal the briefcase full of cash. Is that, that's the story, yeah. right? You find that unreasonable? Who the fuck is going to keep a briefcase full of fucking, what was it supposed to be? A quarter of a million dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, whatever fucking of cash. In, and now I've got it in my closet three weeks later. Do they not have a goddamn bank in Mexico? Well, you hear about this kind of stuff in other things, you know, old reggae artists in Jamaica, even hip hop artists now, when people think you have money and you live in an area that's accessible, a lot of times it's a city area, people think they could just go up to you and take it, you know, especially if it's the, the fucking, I believe these fucking hip hop rap fucking whatever the fucks, I believe they have the money. Because I see them driving around in the goddamn Mercedes and their shit's on the shelf in Walmart and they're playing on the fucking radio and the interwebs and whatever. This is a fucking rush. But this is Lucha is Libre. It, but okay, this is the okay. Mexican wrestling audience. Are they more susceptible to something like this? But when like they this? go to his house and they see <laughs> that he's driving a goddamn Opal Cadet and that he, <laughs> he doesn't live in a god, goddamn mansion... Wouldn't they say, wait a minute, it's a fucking work? Does this guy look like he has a briefcase full of cash in his goddamn house? If, if I mean, am, am I, 
I'm not trying to knock Rush, maybe, but has he been a guy that, do you make a fortune in Mexican wrestling if you're not related to El Santo these days? I don't know what the fuck. I don't know, and it is interesting to the Lucha Libre fans think that the wrestlers there don't make the money that they would make here. And again, here's an image of MJF handing my briefcase full of cash, but the rumor is that when they were going to the gated community, his wife was driving and he was like ducking down so no one would see him, and he said, quick honey, honk the her! <laughs> but uh it's interesting but now, but if now, it is wait true a minute, wait, a minute, wait a minute here's the thing here's the thing he's living in a gated community now Could, has tony khan been paying him for the most of the time over the last couple of what is rush currently making a fortune in in mexico wrestling or is this money coming from AEW? I would think that he probably, based on who he is and what he had done in Ring of Honor and Tony Khan's, what, what he does, I would think Roosh is probably making a few hundred thousand dollars under Tony. Wouldn't you? Okay, but then what I'm saying to you is, was he making any money to, to speak of in Mexico before this? And would he have already established that he, he was somebody that had, was he driving a flashy car? Did he attract the wrong kind of people that they would think that he just kept briefcases with hundreds of thousands of dollars in his house? I'm just, what the fuck? All right. That's well, what I don't understand. It seems like kayfabe may be alive in Mexico. Interesting story there. We'll see what else we can find out. But Jim, let's now go. It seems like it was a year ago, but Monday night. And here, wait, here's another thing. Here's an, I'll make one more point before we move on. So don't cut the clip yet. I believe that the rappers have hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash in their house because every time they get raided, you see them dragging out bags of money along with drugs and guns and whatever the fuck. When's the last time that you saw a wrestler's house raided on the news in any country and they brought out fucking bags of money? I rest my case. Well, get ready. Vince McMahon. Coming soon. <laughs> wrestler. Bags of money. He wrestler. was a world champion, former world champion wrestler, well, Vince McMahon. Pro well, promote, did it, what, what kind of cash did Herb Abrams have on him? Well, I don't know. It was all rolled up with uh, white powder all over it. Yeah, well, there you go. That's still the best wrestling death. But anyway, uh, right. speaking of wrestling deaths, this has nothing to do with it. Let's Let me find you. Oh, actually, actually, yeah, the death of my attention span. Let's go to Raw. You want to go to Raw? Let's go to Raw. I don't even remember if I saw all of it, but the one thing I saw that I actually specifically reached out to you, I said, don't skip this, because I enjoyed it more than I thought I would, and I think you will too, is on this show, but after that, I may have given up on the show. Let's talk about what you saw. Well, and don't worry, folks, because we're going to hit the high spots here, as they say, and, and keep moving. There was three hours of this program, but there were a couple of worthwhile things to pay attention to going forward. And the one thing you mentioned was don't skip Sheamus versus Kaiser. And the, the problem that I have had I haven't had a problem with Kaiser. I've I've said he's a good worker and he he's in great condition and he does the the fucking poo poo face and the introduction perfectly. But I said the problem with Kaiser is that he's been presented along with his partner, which the Italian guy who I don't know what the why Vinci. the fuck that yes Leonardo da Vinci. Why is he even? He's not part of the fucking. He barely through Mussolini. What the fuck? That had to be events. Well, they're all part of the same accent. Um, but they haven't presented him as a serious wrestler on his own. That's why we couldn't buy him in the tag team matches. That's why you great flunky because he's had a chance to shine in that role, but then you can't buy it the other way around. Well, it seems like they're trying to break that booking trend the new administration the the uh Levesque era because this guy he is good and he and and you could tell that Seamus was in on it too that they wanted to go out and you know get this guy over and make him somebody and you know, it, it, basically they did a promo with Seamus where he kind of 
got him over, got, you know, or put him over. See, we're going to see if he's more than just Gunther's announcer. And then as soon as they come, as Seamus comes through the curtain, Kaiser jumps him and starts kicking the shit out of him. And the agents and referees separate it and they go to the break and then they come back on the other side. And they just, they had a stiff back and forth match where I think it was better to do this than normally you would shine the baby face and then the heel would cut him off and get heat where you'd have hope spots, but mostly the heel would be in control and then it come back, blah, blah, blah. They kept this going back and forth because it was more. I think it's important or impactful to have Kaiser constantly on the offense holding his own, then Sheamus coming back, but then Kaiser stopping him again. That kind of back and forth showed that Kaiser was equal to or competitive with or belonging with a guy that's been the world champion, et, et cetera. So, and <clears throat> they just beat the shit out of each other too. Uh, Sheamus is. My goddamn, his deathly pallor, Jesus Christ. If if you gave him a milk enema, it would make him three shades darker. But his his chest turned into ground beef from the chops, and again, they kept it fresh with so much back and forth, and Seamus is selling the leg. At one point, he's not going to let the referee stop it, and dares Kaiser to bring it, and then make a comeback, and more back and forth. And I thought they did a good spot where uh, Kaiser had ripped the uh, the knee pad off the bad leg, and then Sheamus hit a knee lift, and with no pads, a boom. It hurt worse. He, you know, foiled himself. And then finally, they did the deal where they went for the Sheamus went for his finish off the buff. What a white noise! How apropos. And. Kaiser kicked his legs out from under whatever and rolled him up one, two, three. And that's what they've needed to make Kaiser his own guy. He can still be valuable aligned with Gunther and, and, but they can, it, it was just so far the separation between the two stooges and Gunther at the start that especially when there was two of them, you couldn't take them seriously. Now, if they put this guy over a little bit and he's still with Gunther because they match so perfectly, you can even get tags out of it and it won't be out of place. What did you think? I was surprised how much I liked it. And I've never been a big Sheamus fan, but there are matches of his that I've really liked. Actually, the ones with Gunther I really liked. Yeah. This may have been my favorite one. I know it's a weird thing to say, but... I really got into this, maybe because I didn't expect it to be so competitive. I didn't expect it to go as long as it did. I didn't expect Kaiser to get a win. Maybe I should have, but it pulled me in. They got me. And I think a lot of people felt like that. This match was great and it went a while and I kind of wanted it to keep going. It was one of those, like you said, it was back and forth and maybe just the way they paced it and the way they did it. I didn't want it to end. I really enjoyed it. Well, because they weren't just doing the same thing to cut the other guy off, or they they weren't just doing, you know, shit to each other and not selling it. It was back and forth in the good competitive way in that it, it, they kept it fresh doing different things to stop the other guy's momentum and take over for a second. Oh, but oh, oh, shit, boom. And each guy had something that he could sell or some weak point or whatever. And, you know, especially Seamus being so much bigger, uh, he was, you know, selling the, the leg. It's able to take, as Arn Anderson used to say, a three-legged table is no good to anybody. Except there's, there's stools with three legs, but I don't know. We'll figure that out later. It's going to be interesting, too, because Kaiser's been a flunky. Not the feckless flunky, that was his friend, but he's been a flunky, and they gave him a serious edge here, and it worked. And that's not always an easy thing when you see someone get beat over and over again, all of a sudden trying to make them into something more than they were while kind of keeping the same gimmick. But it may work. It worked here, I thought. It was great. 
Well, and and think about it. the the kid works very hard, and he's got a great look as well as you know talent. Uh, just you know, it tripped over bad booking that old line. So, if they're giving him a chance, they <laughs> L.A. Knight was the head of a fucking modeling agency. So maybe anything can happen. Uh, it, did you watch the Braun Breaker segment? I have been watching the Braun Breaker segments the last few weeks. It's been one of the highlights on the show. Well, in that case, let's skip ahead to that because that's the next thing I watched because he is the future of professional wrestling. And I don't give a shit what anybody else thinks because you're all wrong if you don't think that. I, I, I'm amazed again by the natural, by the not only the natural facial reactions, but the timing, and and the body language, and the the it the uh, uh, when to turn the intensity up, and when to fucking turn it down, and when to make your face turn red because you're gonna kill somebody, and when to do the huh, like oh I'll show you. I mean just and and the the work in the ring, it's like. It's like the best parts of Scott and Rick, both. Leaning more toward Rick Steiner, to be honest with you, <clears throat> except for one of the moves in this match. Early Rick Steiner. Uh, uh, er, the early Rick Steiner in, in the Crockett and yeah. Mid-South days when he, you know, again, before they'd really tamed him, he was doing this shit. It was a little more primitive when Rick was doing it. Braun is, is able to take more care of the guys, I think. Rick, he's doing some of the same shit Rick was doing, but his is looks a little bit safer than some of the shit Rick used to do these guys. Anyway, so it's Braun Breaker versus Ricochet. And here's AEW's, their fan base's problem and or their booker's problem in catering to their fan base, in a nutshell, is... Braun Breaker versus Ricochet, their fans and office would look at that and think Ricochet was the star. And the reason why Braun Breaker is the future of wrestling is because they realize in the WWE the Braun Breaker is the star. But you see where I'm going with it because of the stylistic differences, baby. And honestly, the way they worked it was was perfect. Ricochet OP slaps him in the face, but then he starts running around. He's, you know, he's ducking and dodging. He's moving and grooving. And he, he's the smaller guy using the agility and the quickness to stick and move. Breaker's facials are perfect. And I think the only thing I can fault is that a little too much, maybe, that he was keeping Braun off balance. Well, that, that, that was the only thing I was going to ask you. That was the only complaint I actually saw from uh, listeners and stuff was that Ricochet got too much of the match. What do you think of that? Well, yes, at the and here's the thing. Normally, especially when, you know, he's getting laid out at the end, you'd give the baby face a little more at the beginning. But this, again, the, they're in the, the period where Braun Breaker has to make a statement. So... And all, a couple of things got a little contrived, as as Ricochet is wont to do if you don't calm him down a bit. So I liked the, the idea of it. I liked the concept of it. I liked the execution of a lot of it. But they took about two or three things, a little too fancy, before he finally went, boom, no. As Dennis Condry used to say, one tackle pancake. I'll take it from here. And and so that was my fault with it. But then finally, Braun cuts him off with a clothesline. And he barks and he fires up and he takes over. And, you know, they now he's methodical. Now he's not in a fucking hurry. He just goes out to the outside and presses him up and drops him over the fucking barricade and they go to the break. And... <sighs> Again, the, the problem I have with the placement of a lot of the breaks in in some of these matches is some of these things, you can't break up these plays. They're not two-act plays. And what happens is usually it's, oh, 
to the heat spot. Well, now we'll go to the break. We've turned the tide. We've changed the momentum. We've jerked the rug out from under the baby face. He's in jeopardy. Don't go away. Well, that may be a great time to hook the viewer, but what happens when you're trying to feature the heel is that now he's getting the heat in the dark. He's getting the heat in the commercial break. And all too often in modern WWE, apparently it's something they're cueing because they want it to be exciting when they come back. The, the baby face is either in the process or almost in the process of starting his comeback. So that, that that's a rib where you've lost all your fucking heat as the heel in the match. You see what I'm saying? Nobody saw it. Yeah. So when... When Crockett started uh, doing multiple segment matches and going to breaks, it was real time also because even if the show wasn't live, <laughs> they were rolling tape and uh, primitive. So we started putting in spots where we would either get our heat and then go to the break and s not get it first, but we'd get something or we would do it in uh, quick enough at the start where we'd shine the baby face and cut him off for heat and go to the break and we'd come back, we'd still have heat to go. And then we'd do a shorter finish if we had to, but we always got a little bit of our heat on TV. But it's out of the fucking boys' hands these days. But but anyway, that's that's the the drawback to the match, but Ben Boom, he stopped him, Braun did. Hits a couple big moves, and then he did the deal where he's ricochets sitting on the top turnbuckle, but Braun leaps to the top, stands up, poses with his arms in the air, and does a hands-free Frankensteiner to a huge pop, and then spears him out of his goddamn memory. Boom, one, two, three. And it was fucking tremendous. Again, this is how you get somebody over, and this is how a talent gets over. If you look like this and work like this, and goddamn have that emotion and that timing and that innate ability to figure this shit out and come off like a badass, you will get fucking over on television. And there's nobody close to him today in the business to being the biggest star in however many years it takes, two, three, five, whatever the fuck. What'd you think? I've really enjoyed the way they've used Braun Breaker on Raw. I know there was an episode you didn't see just because we've had a crazy schedule the last few weeks, but they've been doing this thing with him and Pierce where... Yeah, no, it was where I didn't have any electricity oh, that's if I didn't see that week's Raw, yes. I said we had a crazy schedule, you had no electricity. It was crazy. But they've been building this thing up that he's kind of an uncontrollable guy. And the fans have been reacting to him. They've been reacting, obviously, to the speed of him running the ropes. There was fan footage I saw on Twitter. I have to think you may have been sent it. But I don't know if you had a chance to watch it. Of him sneaking through the crowd, getting yes. ready to run to the ring. Did you see that? Yes. Um, you know, uh, apparently, because I thought <laughs> that in a lot of... When these guys appear and just tackle somebody from out of nowhere on camera, I thought that they had been smuggling them out you know, under a fucking a cart somehow with their fucking black outfit like a crew cable puller or something. But apparently they send him, he's dressed as himself as he was going to hit the ring and he crept down so low duck walking that nobody noticed him like a fucking cat down this long aisle watching what was going on in the ring and then turning to go down the diagonal aisle and picking up a little speed, and as people started to notice, he timed it where he was over the rail and into the ring and hit the spear perfect from 75, 80 feet away at a dead run. I, uh, the timing was incredible. Between Braun Breaker and Logan Paul, and we'll see what they do with Kaiser since we talked about him earlier. I'll throw him on this list. I don't know how old he is. You have Gunther. You have Jacob Fatu, who has not yet shown himself anywhere. Plus various other people, probably some names we're not even thinking of, people in NXT we're not thinking of, but 
WWE has a lot of a lot of pretty good stars on the horizon right now. Yes, this could be one of the best groups since the you know fabled Attitude Era, and you know. But again, I, I just it, it, the reason why I'm so impressed with Braun Breaker is because you you very seldom find someone that is excelling in every category at this point and has the natural look. And it, whether he whether it was his family or not, I mean, obviously, he reminds us of both. We just said that. But if this was a guy that had no family involvement of, in wrestling and just came to your goddamn school, he'd be doing the same thing. There's no nepotism here whatsoever because he's so far and above anything, any prospect that I've seen in the past few years in the business. I mean, just as in terms of being the guy, you can tell when somebody's going to be a star a lot easier than when you say somebody's going to be the guy. The last time I saw somebody said he's going to be the guy, it was The Rock. And I never thought, I thought Cena would be good. But I didn't think he'd be the guy. Now, the Orton would be great, but I didn't know that he would be at that time. He would be one of the guys, if not the guy. And I didn't think Batista, because I, I didn't know whether he'd make it. But immediately, you saw that. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just fangirling now. Let me fan myself. And you said he reminds you of Ricky, reminds you of Scott. I think everyone who ever saw the Steiners thinks the same thing. It's a shame he's not named Braun Steiner, but that's another story. But it's one thing to wrestle like your dad or to copy your dad. And we've seen plenty of guys do that throughout the years. But it's another thing to just combine, again, his dad and his uncle into what is clearly not a tribute or not just trying to do what they did. It's advancing things. Well, yes, and it's, because again, it's, what else would he do? He's being himself. That's the part. Rick was being himself. And Scott was, as a baby face, Scott wasn't being himself as a young baby face. When he switched heel, he was being himself. And that's what Braun is doing. He's being himself. It looks like that. And they act that way. And that's what gets over. It was a few months back when he was just getting ready to come onto the main roster where you and I discussed people that we thought should beat Gunther. After that long reign, whoever gets the title off him, that's a great spot to be in that can make someone. And we said Braun Breaker, that would have been him as a babyface, more than likely. He's being used now as a heel. Yeah. Is, this the, is this the right move? I'm loving it so far because, you know... I <laughs> I I thought that there would be some element of time that they would just want this you know young athlete and second generation star to oh we're gonna, we're going to cheer him and yay and then once he's established in his backstory and his athleticism and etc then you switch him heel to elevate him to the main event level to the next level well, that's probably what but they just apparently have decided fuck it we're going full on with goddamn here he is. So, but he's doing it great, so I can't argue. And that's the thing, <clears throat> is that I think they just need to, to be very careful with who he shows vulnerability to, what level they are, and how much vulnerability he shows, because so far this has been flawless. He leaves people laying. He's got a grudge against the general manager. You don't put me in a king of the ring? Like, as, as to say, you don't think I'm a main event fucking guy? I'm going to, I'm going to, fucking knock all these motherfuckers out that's you know they haven't had him at a disadvantage to a lesser being or you know competitively slotted into a position here we don't know that he's not a main event guy yet because they haven't told us a lot of time that's what tony will do he'll tell you when <laughs> pretty immediately when his guys aren't main event guys the way he presents them so it and it's again it's it's his own shit, but we we've seen he's taken it to a new level. Scott could have never done that fucking hands free top rope Frankensteiner in a million. And at the same time, 
remember, kids, I'm I'm old. I saw when Rick Steiner started in in pro wrestling. I was already in the fucking main event spot. Rick was the young underneath guy that came to work for Crockett from Mid South, and we were all like, "Wow, he's great in that mid car." And boom, look at this fucking potentially showing, and now he's getting over. And he's the dog face gremlin. But that took what two years, Brian, right? From from Mid South to being featured for Crockett and and the people starting to bark and get with it. Eighty he came into Mid South in eighty five as Rob Rex Steiner. Yeah. Eighty six he became Rick Steiner. They put him with Buzz Sawyer. He was with Eddie Gilbert and Sting, but he was just a a big muscle head who can move, who can kind of wrestle that physical Buzz Sawyer like style. And then after the sale in 87, it really wasn't until early 88 with the Varsity Club that you started seeing signs of the personality. And then by the end of that year, the fans were behind him. I mean, the story famously, notoriously, is that Dusty was mad at Flair. He was going to have Flair drop the title to Rick Steiner in five minutes at Starcade in a cage in 1988. Yeah. And then TBS was like, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so who knows, you know, what the story was, but he was that level of popular at that point. And then in yeah. 89, Scott comes in and then they were one of the best tag teams. People forget, I think, just how good they were and how different they were and the reactions they got from 1990 to at least 94. They were together after that, but yeah. that period of time, they were incredible. Well, it was one of the best tag teams out of the best babyface in ring tag team in in the world at that point. But nevertheless, the point I was making is it. So I saw Rick at this stage of Braun's career, and Braun's better. He's I'm not, he's smoother. He he's got the timing. He's got the ring positioning and the the rope hitting is freaky. But I mean, everything that Rick Steiner did was freaky athletically, also. And to be honest, some of the stuff I think that Rick did, either the bumps he took or the shit that he gave, it looked so good and it got over so well because he was out of control. He would just goddamn fling himself through the ropes at the floor in places. I and remember you some of those bumps, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, but you couldn't. he couldn't hurt himself. But that's probably not something that the WWF or WWE would encourage with Braun, so... Point is, Braun is further along in his in-ring as well as his television presence than Rick was, and look how big a star Rick ended up being. And Scott, he's farther along. Because remember, Scott, two years in, was the the eager, young, baby-faced muscle head that was shitty on promos. So, And Braun's got a better tan than either one of them. But nevertheless, otherwise than that, it was kind of fucking, it was a sad show. A sad, sad situation that got more and more absurd. Well, that's Raw. Is that everything we have to say about Raw? Do you have more to say about Raw? I got nothing else to say about Raw this week. If I had to ask you to guess whether it would be a good show or a bad show next week, to put a wager on it or to pick six somehow in this equation that makes no sense, What I'm trying to say, Jim, is there are a lot of people out there who may want to pick six. There's a lot of people out there. You might you might tell the people what it is at first there. Well, what it is and how it be is uh, what we are here to tell you, the fine people. (laughs) And what we're going to tell you about is our friends at DraftKings. Well, see, because now are the NBA playoffs still going on? Yes, they are. Well. It's, These, it's getting they to the can, end, yeah. Huh? It's getting to the end, yes. It's getting down to the nitty-gritty. It's getting down to nut-cutting time. But they, they go on forever, and then something else will take its place, folks. But thanks to DraftKings, they're official partners with everybody. They just, they sleep around. They know everybody. But they're official partners of the NBA, I'll have you know. And there's a new fantasy game from DraftKings. It's brand new. We've been talking about it for months. It's called Pick 6. And here's how to play during the NBA playoffs. You pick between two and six players and choose if they're going to have more of a stat 
or less of a stat. And whether it's rebounds or points or assists or any of the other things that they do in the NBA with each other or for each other or in conjunction with each other. And you can track your picks and play against other people for a shot to win huge cash prizes. And listen to this now, Brian, because this is new information that we are imparting to the listeners here. First time pick six players. That means if you have played pick six before, if you have picked at six before, you're not eligible. Only the first time pick six players, because they're the lucky ones. You get a deal. How do they word this? You play $5 and you get 50 in pick six credits. So that's like 10 times as much. And then if you win money, the huge cash prizes with those free credits that you've got because you played the $5, well, then you'll make even more money. And then if money falls from the sky and you've got a big-ass bucket, then you're going to be farting through silk. So right now, download the new fantasy app, the Pick 6 from DraftKings, an official partner of the NBA, and do these things with these statistics, and then track your picks, and try to elbow these other son of a bitches out of the way, and win this big money. And new customers, if you play $5, you get $50 in pick six credits. Sounds like a great deal. So, again, and that's new customers only, because we want you, you young, innocent people out there, no, that's not the way we should look at it. We want those who have not yet experienced the Pick 6 app. Oh, virgins. Say. All right. <laughs> well, all right. If you're a virgin, <laughs> then download. A, a Pick 6 virgin, for the record. Well, uh, hey, I'm, I'll take six virgins if you've got them. That's not what I, I don't said. Need to pick. I don't need to pick. Just send them to me at random. You get no virgins. I'm talking about virgins to the pick you six. Know, well, actually, I don't really want a virgin because what? I don't want a amateur to put a roof on my house. Why would I want somebody inexperienced at anything? But folks, if you've got some experience playing more or less, then that's what you can do now and pack more fun into less time. Download the... New fantasy app from DraftKings. Pick six. Uh, play the $5. Get the $50 in credits. For if you use the code JCE, that's the way you're going to get those 50, 50 credit dollar thingies. Are, is this, are these like Thornberry's toys that had thorny bucks when I was a kid? Thornberry toys? Yes, they had thorny bucks when you got... When you bought a certain amount of level of dollar toy fucking expenditure you would get a five dollar or a ten dollar or a twenty dollar thorny buck and you could bring them in and your parents got money off the future toys well i don't know if it's like that but it's a great deal for those who are inclined to pick six the crown is yours mine Yes. Do we have a new voiceover? I see we have new copy. Uh, did, we, we don't have a new voice. Did Arnold re redo that, or should I just run through this real quick? Arnold is off today. Okay. One per new customer. Non-withdrawable pick six credits expire in six months. Limited time offer. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. 18 plus in most eligible states. Not available in all states, including New York and Connecticut. Eligibility restrictions apply. Void where prohibited by law. See terms at pick6.draftkings.com slash promos. Well, Jim, we still have a lot more road to cover here on the show. Of course, we're going to talk about who's killing AEW. But first, we promised the people <laughs> to talk about who's ki who killed WCW. A lot of assassins. Assassins. Are you an assassin? Are you an Ellen boy? Uh, no, you know, as a matter of fact, the Who Killed WCW is a four-part series for those of you who've been living under a rock that just debuted on Vice TV here a few days ago from uh, the co-creators uh, or cre co 
Goddamn, they're not co-creators. They are the creators. Evan Husty and Jason Eisner, the cohorts the that created of, the creators, the creators of, of, of the but they code, they co-did it. They're codependent on each other. Well, that's the S in creators, the creators of Dark. Side okay, of the well there you. Are. I wanted to be correct, but anyway, they're they're uh, they're behind this as well as the Rocks Production Company. Uh, Bullshit a, Enterprises. <laughs> now, now, wait a minute, Mister LLC. <laughs> <laughs> LLC for limited liability is the key. But anyway, we got, we want to talk about that, but it, here's the problem is we've still got, as you said, dynamite and the ratings and this other craziness with Tony. And I want to give this series more time because I understand why they did it or why they're doing it. They started the who killed WCW story pretty much with Eric Bischoff's arrival in what 92 ish or early 93, whatever it was, because he, let's say he's the most charming storyteller on the, on the broadcast. And you can tell why the people would put him in charge of shit that he knew absolutely nothing about because he's fucking smooth as silk. And, and I'm not denying he's found his niche as one of the great television performers verbally and personality wise in wrestling. But anyway, I, I just had remarked to you earlier off the air, as they say, that they started in the middle because who killed WCW? They had already, they resurrected it and killed it again because TBS had already killed WCW by 1993. So to really to go back and give our audience more of a, a context and an idea of what was going on that was real and factual, especially because I was there long before Eric was, uh, we need to take more time. I think we should, we should do this on the experience where we give them the first, the first five years and then delve into some of the, the bullshit and shenanigans going on on this first episode. Cause they they still spent most of this episode. We don't know who the murderer was because they had to tell us who the the victim was. So they were telling us who WCW was, and some of this is skewed from some of the participants as well. Yeah, I'm glad The Rock was able to participate because that was the valuable voice about the death of WCW that everyone was looking for. He loved watching it on television. <sighs> Well, but he's, he's rock there's, there's means ratings. Say. Rock means ratings. Yeah, I don't know if he's going to mean ratings for this. I don't know why his ex-wife's name is all over this thing. Like, that fucking matters to anybody. Was that a divorce? Yeah, about, is that a divorce settlement thing? She, I was about to say she might have got custody of the production company or something. That's what I wonder if, like, it's a settlement thing. Like, I'm your partner 50-50 for the rest of your life on everything because I know. What do you know? I don't know. She knows. Maybe. Not, Alleg not allegedly. Not that you know. She knows where all the bottles of piss are. They're in Gewurz's hey. room. They're in the closet Gewurz sleeps in. Well, you can't argue with that. He looks like a, a person who'd like to sleep around urine. Well, like you said, there's a lot of things to talk about from that debut episode, and we're going to spend a lot of time on it, on the experience, so we don't blow past it, because, like I said before, we have to talk about not who killed WCW, but who's killing AEW. Ugh. Before we talk about dynamite, before we talk about ratings, this happened after all that. This happened last night as we are recording, 15 hours ago as we are recording, around 1 a.m. Tony Khan took to Twitter. <laughs> that, that never, just right there, that preamble, it, it's going to go south from here. I book wrestling for the sickos because that's what I am, and that's who I care about. Hashtag Dynamite, Rampage, Collision, and Forbidden Door. Then he posted an image of an upcoming match. Z <laughs> I'm not familiar with this female luchador. Zeusus? Or... What? Zeusus? I think it's Zeusus. Wait, Zeusis. no, ho, ho, what are you... <laughs> Zeus My God, man, are you screaming for help? What is Z going... Z-E-U-X-I... S. Oh, Zoot Suit. 
Oh, Zoot Suit, she's over in the southern provinces of Mexico. If Zoot Suits wins the TBS championship from Mercedes Monet on Wednesday night in Des Moines, <laughs> that looks a hot pad. Then donkeys <laughs> will fly. She will take the title to CMLL, and then Stephanie Vacor versus Mercedes Vernado. Uh, that's Mercedes Monet. My uh, Forbidden Door will be for the NJPW Strong Championship only. You what? Got all that? What? Uh, no, I need a fucking court stenographer to get all that. I guess Mercedes Monet, if she loses the TBS Championship to Zoot Suit, then the match at Forbidden Door against Stephanie Vacour will only be for the New Japan Strong Women's Championship. Who would possibly give two flying French fried titty fucks? The sickos. Oh, let's back up to that one. Well, hold on. There's one more tweet to. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. There's more. There's always more. Well, there's two more actually. Now that I see it to oh, round off this uh, round here. Wake up the bots and tell them we're having fun over here in AEW. The same hashtags as before, and then someone. Uh, Sent the tone. How, how much fun are they having over there in AEW at two o'clock in the morning? Do you remember uh, that really awful movie, Back to the Beach, where Annette Funicello and Frankie Avalon went back to the beach? In oh the 80s? God, yes, but they were they were in their forties and it didn't work. Well, they get into a fight and they're all on the beach with their family. It's the it's a ridiculous movie. Fishbone all of a sudden shows up and does a ska song with a Nefunicello. <laughs> but anyway, they're all on the beach and a Nefunicello and all the girls are kind of having a good time and Frankie Avalon and the boys are trying to convince them. They're like, we're having fun, fun, fun. Because people who are having fun usually yell out the word fun. Fun! I think that's what this is from Tony. We're having fun over here in AEW. <laughs> <laughs> well, then um, he retweeted a person who sent him an image of Darth Vader Wrestling is a high-stakes cutthroat business. And then he plugged a couple of his other shows. Wait a minute. Who's trying to cut his throat? Who is actively, besides Tony, through self-inflicted wounds, who is actively trying to cut his throat? His dad's accountant. Well, well besides him. <laughs> besides Touche. But, I mean, I mean the... At this point, the WWE's so far out ahead. Are they, have we heard that they are actively trying to sabotage the W, the, the W, or the AEW in some kind of way anymore since they've seen what the fuck's going on? We will get back to the sickos in a moment. On this topic, it's kind of timely. There's an accusation right now that WWE leaked to Forbes, the Fast Nationals last week, and said that Collision only did like 133,000 viewers. So the real ratings didn't come out for a few days. So that was circulating online, even though someone like me and most thoughtful people out there saw that and said, that's ridiculous. I know they're doing bad numbers, but that's just off the charts bad. And it was fake. The rumor is that WWE has been circulating false information to damage AEW, and also there's an accusation kind of back and forth, really, about bots. <laughs> about bots being used by WWE to say nasty things about AEW, and then someone just posted something in the cult of Cornell. Aren't the there, are, I was about to say, aren't there bots to say something bad about everybody? I know we've got a lot of bots. This, this lady named fucking Betty Bunch of Numbers is just all over my ass. Well, I think the difference is Tony's bots say good things about AEW. WWE's bots say bad things about AEW. They're not saying good things about WWE. It's not like, we're the best. It's great. It's more like, that AEW is a bunch of shit. Don't you agree? And then everyone starts agreeing. Okay, but in the real world, have they shut them out of arenas? Have they damaged their television Stephen P. New shut them out of arena. network? Stephen P. New apparently shut them out of Beckley. That's well, why yeah, they're they, down the road. Yeah, they were, they were trying to get the Raleigh County Armory down there, but <laughs> that's uh that didn't happen but uh, they're trying to run off the the local guy fans there instead of running off the national fans but nevertheless i don't give a fuck if there's bots talking about each other on twitter i'm telling you if, if wwe was doing what they were doing to crockett or what they were doing to wcw in the attitude era 
They'd be shutting them out of buildings or they'd be kicking them off fucking television stations or fucking with their networks or damaging the pay-per-views or this is an interesting question. real wrestling war shit. Well, well, that's the interesting question right there, because in the past, like you were just talking about, there have been plenty of examples of wrestling wars and warring promoters doing shit to fuck up the other guy's business. Set the goddamn other guy's arena on fire. In this case, Tony and AEW believe that WWE is just using false information to damage them. Even the accusations we've seen a couple times now when a sports media person or a media reporter puts that information that's negative to AEW, it comes out, oh, they're friends with Nick Khan. As if Nick Khan is feeding them the information to put out there. So okay, but, but whether it's reasonable or not, they certainly believe it. Or Tony certainly Hold on a second. It. So supposedly WWE said it was 133,000 people and it was actually, I would assume, much more than that because even as you mentioned, the so low they have fallen... That's ridiculous. Or was that the number in the key demo or something? Or was that just a preposterous number? See, that was the other thing. They were claiming the key demo number was 34,000. I was like, no way. That's just completely Okay, ridiculous. yeah, okay. But the point is, this is Forbes, right? But this, is the, this ain't Forbes magazine. This is Forbes on... We've read articles from them and other, like Sports Illustrated, before this is not... Somebody that's going to be talking to Nick Khan himself personally that's writing this article on their website, right? One would imagine. I, I, you, you don't know where information comes from. I don't want to make any accusations because I haven't seen the source article from Forbes. So we're just repeating. Okay, what but we he's heard. not quite. He's that he's not quoted. So the point is, why would Nick Khan or anyone important in the WWE? tell Forbes a number or any information that was going to be proven to be complete bullshit in the next 48 hours or so and have them print it to where whoever wrote this fucking article that said that it was 133,000 had to come back later on and explain to somebody, well, no, I believed so. Well, fuck you. Check your sources or don't write bullshit, whatever. Why would they... Anybody meaningful in the company, why would they do that over something that trivial? And for the record, I don't know if it was Rampage or Collision, but last week's Collision, June 1st, at 378,000 viewers. Uh, it was the lowest key demo number since March 30th, but it's not you know, outrageous considering what they've been doing. 378. Let me see if there's anything for Rampage. But, and another thing I'm saying, is, did this... 255 did this... for Rampage. Okay, well, bless their little pee-picking hearts. Preempted airing. Did this goddamn journalist that would, you know, put fucking Mike Wallace and Dan Rather to shame that wrote this article, did he talk to somebody in the office as an unnamed source or whatever, and they just threw out some dub, yeah, they're doing 120 fucking something thousand people on Saturday nights or whatever, and he ran with it? They're just bullshitting. There, I'm saying that for something this trivial, there's no upside to bury yourself as a source to Forbes if you want to be a source to Forbes to begin with. And it's not like it wasn't something they were going to be able to disprove when they actually got the public announcement of the goddamn ratings. So what? what is the meaning of this? Or did this reporter just misunderstand uh, what the fuck was going on and fuck up or who knows what the fuck Well, happened. again, you say reporter and I said Forbes. That's what I heard. I haven't actually seen what caused it. I heard people, because we saw comments in the YouTube videos, like, when are they going to talk about 133,000 viewers? And I'm like, never, because that didn't happen. <laughs> but it was reported. It got out there somehow. But again, it was that. There's the dueling bots. And then we have... I'm doing this for the sickos. I'm one of them. They're who I care about. What's this all about? Is it some... Has someone told him a story, or has he come up with it himself, that he has romanticized the passion that he and the talent and the, the really true wrestling fans... You almost need some goddamn patriotic music behind this. The passion and love and emotion that they all feel for the business, it's a sickness. We're the sickos. 
is he again placing himself as the the benefactor of a large group of sickos who love the same thing and he's able to bring it to them because he has 750 million dollars is that kind of a mental thing going on there brian I, i'm just an amateur small town bird psychiatrist yeah, what defines a sicko, I guess, is the question. Is any AEW fan a sicko, or is it like the people who stay up to the middle of the night to see something with no fans from Japan on a streaming service? I mean, what's a sicko? I don't know. It's the community that he listens to that some of them are in the ring and some of them are out of the ring in the seats. Some of them are some of them are wearing the athletic supporters and some of them are swinging from them but it's a small but vocal group of people that have insist that this kind of indie minded outlaw wrestling and their mentality is somehow the way to go pinocchio and they're going to stick to it until shad is down to his last dollar go ahead i'm sorry First of all, I just don't know if he understands how bad he looks and he looks worse and worse on Twitter. I know that there is an audience that gets a kick out of him behaving like a buffoon, but it's a diminishing audience, and hopefully he sees that too, and it doesn't help the company acting like a child. You're like 40, aren't you? I mean, come on, act your age. Secondly, and let, I, me, let me just interject. He's the guy that if if it's a major network television deal or a major sponsorship, that he would be in the conversation. And he's acting like this on Twitter when he's going to be meeting with people who don't act like this on Twitter. Go ahead, number two. I book wrestling for the sicko. That, just that right there. I book wrestling. This is my goal with booking wrestling. This is what I do. He's a horrible booker. He can't book. And he has a lot of people who know him, who believe that, and are afraid to say it out loud. He's a horrible booker. He cannot book American wrestling television. No, but he books for people just like him. And that's the problem where is he takes all the, the, the compliments and the praise and none of the condemnation and the blame. And he thinks that uh, there's a lot. And because his... His EVPs feed that notion with their indie mindset that there's enough people out there that will love this kind of stuff that there ain't a lot of people out there going to love this kind of stuff that ain't already there. And they're dwindling. This thing's never going to go away because Tony has unlimited funds for it. So we probably will never get a who killed AEW. But we'll probably get a Tony's folly. We'll probably get just people talking about what a complete shit show this has been since the beginning, and it gets worse and worse. Just look at the state of Tony. It gets worse and worse. The TV show gets worse and worse. The highs are lower and lower. It just is a sad I, I don't thing. Know, I, don't know, I don't know if all of Tony's highs are lower. It's a crazy thing to see all of this and know that nothing is going to change. This was all bought and built for him. To do this, not to set up a successful business, not to truly compete with WWE, just for Tony to have his plaything and hopefully make a few bucks at it. But if he doesn't, who gives a shit? It's a write off. And that's the state we're in right now. You have a guy running a wrestling company who doesn't have to pay attention to the bottom line in any way. And because of that, as one of the many reasons, he produces a show that a smaller and smaller audience likes with smaller and smaller amounts of actual stars on it, and most of these people, the fans go silent during their matches. And it's not going to get better. It's going to keep getting worse. <sighs> well, would you like to start with the good and end with the bad? Because that's what they did on TV this week. Before we talk about Dynamite, as we are about to, did you see the clip I sent you that a lot of the listeners were sending us? Apparently Brian Alvarez had a meltdown over it. I saw it live. Tony oh Khan God! On. Oh yeah, that was on the on the previous Saturday's show that was maligned in the press, right? On AEW Collision, there was a segment where Roddy Strong stormed Gorilla with Christopher Daniels, who had just been anointed that Wednesday as the new executive <laughs> vice president, the authority figure everyone wanted on AEW, 
a bootleg Adam Pierce, and Roddy Strong storms Tony Khan's area, doesn't lunge at him, that's why he still has a job, demands a title match. And Tony's reacting like, like a silent movie comedian. I mean, just his eyebrows are going, his face is going, like he's reacting like there's no sound. <laughs> and he needs to express something. He, he, he looks like Ben Turpin. <laughs> so this is, this is all happening. Roddy Strong's demanding a title match. Roddy Strong just lost his belt to Will Ospreay, who had to win a gauntlet match to get a title match at the pay-per-view. Roddy Strong's demanding a title match. Tony goes, okay, that sounds fair. You get one this Wednesday on Dynamite. Well, Christopher Daniels stands there and does nothing. I told you, Tony's not going to be able to back away. He wants to be on camera. But well, what did you think of this? Oh, this is, and see, you've explained it perfectly, and nobody has a fucking clue what you said because it's so goddamn confusing. So let's back up a minute and analyze a couple of the different things that are wrong with it. As you said, Christopher Daniels has just been announced and appointed as uh, Tony, whatever the title they gave him, to adjudicate things like this by Tony Khan himself. He's speaking for Tony, right? That was the way they gave it. And also, they're doing, they're doing this whole thing with, with the buckaroos and the EVPs that have gone heel and rogue and it, it, that are supposedly running the show and going around bullying people and telling them what to do, taking an unfair advantage. But they are still establishing that Tony Khan is sitting right at the fucking gorilla position on the edge of the stage watching the monitor. He's present. He's watching everything. He can make a comment if he wants to. He can send Daniels out to do it if he wants to. It, anything that happens, one would think with him there and he's the owner, he would be in charge. There's another logic loophole. And then the whole idea to have this multiple man gauntlet match was that the winner would get a title shot. And because Ostrich won it before Roddy got in it, that then Roddy is demanding from Tony Khan a title match. While, as you said, Daniels is standing there watching mute and Tony is standing there with these awkward facial movements and body language. Uh, and he's nodding and he's just, instead of even listening to Roddy's ranting intently and not revealing, you know, his emotions either way until the end so that you would hang on it, he's nodding with everything he said. Oh, yeah, my hump, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds great. Give him a title match. Then why did your new fucking star have to beat these other 16 guys or whatever? And there's Daniel Stanner doing it. And don't, what the fuck sense does any of this make? And I mean, <laughs> He just made Daniels the authority figure on Wednesday. The week before, yes. The week, the week of. I mean, it was the week of. The week of, yes. The Wednesday before. And he cut off his balls three days later. <laughs> <laughs> But I may even let him do it. But just why is he just standing there? And why are you running the show? And why can you nod like that when you got pile driven? But it just... the, the it, Why can't he stop any of the things that get played on the monitor? Like, why can't he do anything if we've now established there he is? And he can make all the decisions he wants. Yeah. Can he tell the truck, don't, don't play that video that the Jacksons just told you to play? I don't like it. So, I mean, there's part of the problem when you talk about Tony's booking. Tony, after Dynamite, thought this would be a good idea to, on this show, immediately reveal himself as an authority figure while Daniels just stands there, and booking-wise, for Roddy Strong to just get a title match. Why is it that simple? Hey, it sounds like a good idea. Well, thankfully, when the, when the bad shit happens on Collision, someone clips it and sends it to us, so I can make sure you see it. Well, I appreciate that highly, Brian. That's very kind of you. Would you like to get to blowing our nose with dynamite this week? Let's get to AEW Dynamite, which this week was live from nah. an arena near you. 
June the 5th, where were they? I don't even remember. Uh, do you have that information in front you, of you? You know what? I'm sure I do. But as I'm, well, I'll save this other thing for uh, later. Let me. Uh, oh, me good Lord. AW well, Dynamite was in. These are the ratings. Colorado. <laughs> Loveland, Colorado. Loveland, Colorado. Loveland. At the, Loveland, at the Blue FCU Arena. The the who blue who arena what the blue FCU arena well FCU two motherfucker <laughs> for the record twenty six hundred tickets distributed oh Jesus distributed comp and everything whether they came or not but I remembered Colorado finally because of MJF's interview he said and pardon me if my eyes are red but. Uh, MJF came out and did the, uh, they had no intro or nothing, no opening theme. It's into his music and he can, they had real MJF chants, not piped in shit. And he's our scumbag. All that you could tell that it was a, it had the sound of a small group at a big building, but all they were all making the noise. It's not his fault. The many, drawbacks the rest of the company has it's got them to the point where he had to go out in a big building with 2600 people in it maybe and and he stole the show he's he's a he's an incredible performer he's quick he's witty he's got inflection he's he's a fucking he's a show off and he's articulate, and he's got great material, and it's all his. And and we'll talk about when he was interrupted, but at first, you know, that's the thing is they, at one point, he was the best thing on the show, but there were people you wanted to see fight him or him fight or whatever cart you want to put before the horse. You could see the matches, right? Now it's just, I just want him to come out and talk because it's better than whatever else they're doing. But what the fuck can he do here now that means anything with the rest of these fucking morons? You know what I'm saying? That's probably the biggest problem. MJF is the biggest star in AEW by far. He's the one who moves the numbers and has traditionally for ratings, for merch, when he turned babyface, for pay-per-view buys. His feuds, when they played out on pay-per-view, the good ones, not like Chris Jericho, they've done business. And they need him, as I said before, more than ever. And he goes out there and he gets a better reaction than everyone still. Maybe a smaller crowd, he still gets the best reaction. The problem is, what's he going to do? Not to steal from Hulk Hogan. Yeah. But who... Him and Roosh is interesting, okay. Oh, no, it's but, not. But after that, you know, I brought up before, him and Osprey is something I think people would really want to see, but it doesn't look like we're going to get that anytime soon. Omega's not around. That's a match we never got. Well, I'm beginning to wonder if we're not going to get MJF and Osprey at Wembley. Because why else would they be fucking already trying to give us Osprey and Swerve? In, unless they, you know, because... But but to, to answer your question, yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. MJF is still the biggest star on this show. They need him on this show. But you almost rather have him just come out there and rip on the roster than actually do anything with them. Because he can tell the truth in such an entertaining way. I, I don't know, he reminds me of somebody. But that's the point. He put himself over and he listed his accomplishments. He rattled off the names that he's beaten that... Ostrich hasn't. And, you know, it, it just, he, he established, he pissed on his territory again, but then suddenly music interrupts and it's Rush. It's fucking seriously Rush. Rush. Him? Rush. Not Rush. Rush. Hey, well, listen, quit eating fucking beans late at night. You wouldn't have that condition. And, here comes Rush, and he fucking gets on the microphone, and he loudly gargles oatmeal. What the... F and it's the MGF has to make money. I'm sorry, I, I don't know what the fuck you're saying. He learned how to say horns between the last promo and this promo. And uh, there, was a, there was a line where he called Ostrich the Cockney Cockhead. 
You know, and he can get away with these things with the wink and the nod and everything. When Moxley just comes out and just fuck. But here, the the whole point is, this guy can barely speak. I again, I've said before, I don't know if he can speak Spanish. He ain't barely can speak English. But the fans don't give a shit. They were whatting him. This audience was whatting him. Where it's not, it didn't even used to be cool to do that. And. MJF had to make fun of him. I didn't get any of that. And, you know, the, the MJF is having to, as a baby face, or at least try to get people behind him, he's having to say, boy, Tony Khan, I thought he was bad at running this place, but the elite are worse because he's, it, it's obvious what's going on here. And MJF blisters Rush while trying to kind of put him over or, or he tried to, but, and he spoke to him in Spanish and got bleeped, and then they had a big pull apart. But this is good. Nobody cares about R Rush, and he was saying, why do you been gone? At least I think that's what he was saying. Why do you been gone? I've been here or working. Well, we never see this fucking guy. Where has he been here working? By the way, he was gone. Wasn't he healing up an injury? It's not like he was on vacation. Yeah, I think he's been hurt longer than fucking MJF was. And the last time we saw him was when he beat the shit out of Jungle Jack off. And that's the thing. This w Nobody cares about him, and he's a, he thinks he's a star and doesn't want to sell anything. So why do we want to see this with MJF, who is probably now the best in-ring worker they got in the company in terms of logical sensible fucking work in terms of and, getting fans invested in matches i think you could argue too that's logical sensible fucking work you know what did i say mjf every time he has to repair himself after a thing like he did with the chris jericho program he starts off with a few weeks of feuding with someone who if they were going to elevate here's the it, chance so here's rushi's chance he could really take the opportunity by the hands <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, the other problem is MJF is back as a heel and it's almost impossible and he should be a heel, but it's almost impossible for him to be him and not get cheered, especially against a guy that the fans aren't invested in. I don't, well, it's well, not like he's coming out there, you know, like so he has a, is he a heel? I'm pretty sure he's a heel. Well, it doesn't sound like it because he's knocking everybody. And he's saying he's the best, the same thing he's always done. And this is where they put themselves, in that the people want him to be an asshole and be the, the real devil and be the, the guy who says horrible things about people and does horrible things to people so bad that there's nobody strong enough that he can betray, fuck over, or goddamn uh, ruin their life in some kind of way that the people will take their side. You see what I'm saying? No, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying. I mean, that's the problem in a way with the way things have been booked out and the lack of star power in AEW. Any young guy that MJF tries to elevate is not going to be able to get over past MJF. And... In terms of main event guys, again, Will Ospreay in him is something. Swerve in him could probably be something. Past that who? Past that what main event level guy? Danielson we've seen. Moxley we've seen. Jericho we never need to see again. <laughs> so I think those are the two things for MJF to look forward to on the horizon. I don't see long-term money in MJF and Ostrich simply because... MJF is not going to have one of those matches where they're doing goddamn constant gymnastics and fucking hurt himself and et cetera. So they would have to work, which would, would we've seen Ostrich can do when he's forced to. But I don't see a long rivalry there because, you know, bruv on the promos, it sounds great when he's out there by himself, but when he's trying to go back and forth with MJF, come on, seriously. Swerve maybe could step up verbally, but they've neutered him to the point where the swerve of 
three months ago and, and MJF would have been holy shit. But now it's like, eh. I brought up Osprey, so I'll bring it up here. He's one of the guys getting over. He's one of the guys they're pushing in their weird way, but he's still getting over on his own. And he was off this week. He was back home in England after you know working two matches the uh, previous week or whatever it was. The, 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 somebody put out he's taking a sabbatical because of his grueling schedule. And then he came out and said, what sabbatical? I'll be back next week. But I guess the question is, is it hard to... If you know you have someone who's going to be home at least every three weeks or four weeks, is it hard to build around that person? Well, no, if there was well, a Roman, legitimate... Actually, Roman Reigns has been home a lot, so I shouldn't even ask yeah. this question. But no, if there was a legitimate good reason for it, uh, then then no, you know, it, that you used to do that with legends that were working part-time or big names that would come in and draw you some money or help you out. But a guy that you've signed to be paid every fucking week to work basically one day a fucking week and wants to live in England, I don't give a goddamn. And, and, and if this was again, <clears throat> a generation ago when people's payoffs were tied to the money they drew and the tickets they sold, you would have done. You would have crawled across broken glass before you would have missed being on TV for a fucking week as a talent, as a main event guy. So I don't have any sympathy for either fucking side. I think they're both marks. And one last thing on this from me, and then we'll uh, talk about something else here. MJF was not on last week's show. We heard from a lot of listeners who said that last week's show, whatever bump in the number there was was specifically because people thought MJF was going to be there and he wasn't. He was back here this week, quarter one. Was that the way you would have used him? <laughs> well, forget about the booking of it, but in terms of placement, is that how you would have? It, no, if I, it? if I wanted to make sure that MJF was in the top rated segment of the fucking show, I would, yes, but <laughs> They they advertised it last week, MGF Returns to Dynamite. At the top of the program, why didn't they show... I know the other folks do it, but it's kind of working. Why didn't they show on the screen the goddamn whatever conveyance, vehicle, motorized carriage or whatever that he comes to the building in and his designer shoes step out and he's in the building. Holy shit, what's he going to say? What's he going to do? Welcome, blow off the fucking pyro, and here's the best match we can have to put on first and talk about what MJF might do later on. And put him at the top of the 9 o'clock hour. You need good communicators on commentary for that. They don't have that. Well, <laughs> but I'm just saying, I'm saying what I would do, and then you could have people fucking running and fetching and carrying things and taking them to his door and knocking on a door and taking it whatever the fuck you could tease seeing him for the whole first hour and then at the top of nine o'clock there you go in this pull apart and then you could say we're going to get a goddamn a comment from him on the way and you could shoot him on the way out to the 9 30 hour or it's all over and he's done Thank you for your 15 minutes of service, viewers. Well, maybe after the match with Roosh, which will either be on TV or at Forbidden Door, I'm not exactly sure what the building for, oh, what, what they are building for in English here. Maybe MJF will be sore. Maybe he'll be achy. Maybe he'll need a good night's sleep because of this booking. Maybe he'll need a hookup for some CBD, and we know exactly where to send them. Well, that's it. We don't even have to send him because they'll send you. Well, they'll send it to you, and then, boy, this stuff will send you. And that's our friends at CB Distillery and or the, the fine website, cbdistillery.com. Because, uh, Brian, we've talked about this before. Whether you want to sleep better, whether you want to recover from exercise better, whether you want to reduce pain, all these type of things, have you heard about these surveys? 81% of customers experienced more calm 
80% said CBD helped with pain after physical activity, 90% said they slept better with CBD, and 1% said they saw birds in their garage. Have you heard about these surveys? This is one of those ones I can't dispel. Well, so right now, they've got over 2 million customers and a solid 100% money-back guarantee. If you give them money and you don't like the shit they it ain't like on the playground or out on the street corner, they'll give you your money back if you don't like their shit. Because it's, it's no fluff, no fillers, pure, effective CBD solutions. And you know what the, the CBD solutions are, don't you? Well, I know That's every, they've got them. Every problem can be solved with CBD. Huh. That's henceforth the solutions. You're, you're natural. No, none of the artificial sweeteners that you might find in other things that'll make you sleep or make you feel better. CBD comes from the earth, folks. It comes from nature. It comes from the goddess that rules us all. On the island of, uh, where was Wonder Woman's island, goddamn, but to Paradise Island. That's where it comes from, and they, they truck it into Jersey, somewhere in Teterboro, and they make this stuff at CB Distillery. That is anyway. not in any way how the process works, but you can trust CB Distillery to deliver you the finest CBD, the freshest CBD, the <laughs> number one CBD out there. Isn't that right, Jim? Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, they can, and I'll tell you what, whether it, whether it's, whether you'll start out feeling like you're in Teterboro and you'll end up on Pleasure Island. Right now, just visit cbdistillery.com and use the code JCE for 20% off. 20% another thing you can't get on a playground is a discount with a code cbdistillery.com. And use the code JCE for 20% off the fine products that will help you feel better and think better and, and be healthier in the long run. And you'll be able to run long distances. And probably without even people chasing you. Okay, with CB that's, that's Distillery. What I got. Th yeah, that's CB what you got. Once again, cbdistillery.com code JCE before you ask. For all your CBD solutions, CB Distillery. Back to. Yes, ho! Oh. Back to a man who loves his THC, Tony Khan, and Dynamite. Well, I skipped Pockets versus Kyle O'Reilly versus Jay Lethal versus Felix because I've, I hate to see Jay Lethal wasted. Kyle's already buried, and you can't take that seriously. But so. Let's ask, what is Jericho doing now? I saw somebody on Twitter say, but it's not hard to come up with this viewpoint. He's been on television for 30 years. We know what he talks like, what he acts like. What it, It's not a matter of changing a gimmick or a nickname or a, a catchphrase or a way you're dressing or switching from babyface to heel. He's just... A, why is he doing this? Why is he why is he screaming? Why it, it's like old 90s cable access with guys with a camcorder that weren't even doing necessarily a wrestling show, but just a show where they thought they were doing funny improv of some description. And it, 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 the, the screaming of and here's the way that you ladle the beans out of the, or whatever the fuck, to everybody. What? Who is this for? Who wants to see this? Chris Jericho. Uh, and Dave Meltzer. Apparently Dave put it over. He likes he, it? Apparently he put it over and said it was funny. I haven't heard it, but a bunch of people oh. sent me. You got to hear Dave Meltzer say that the Jericho stuff is good comedy. What? <sighs> All right. It's awful, and it's so over-the-top bad that it's, like, you cringe watching it almost. Because it's a desperate attempt for a desperate guy to hold on. He's run out of things he could do, so now he's just doing stupid. Drag big bill down. Unfortunately, this may be the best thing Brian Keith does in AEW. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> but he's dragged Big Bill down to do this fake acting, similar to the Young Bucks doing the same thing on the show. Roddy Strong just went through a period screaming at everyone. Now Jericho's doing that, just roaming the hallways. For, for what reason? Like, what's the point of all this? Yeah, they, they have a camera following the Jericho Vortex so that he can go around and tell random people how to execute their jobs or perform their tasks in a, in a voice that sounds like Robin Leach's. See, that's how you know Tony Khan. See, this is where Tony Khan needs to step in and say, Chris, I know you're not going anywhere for a long time. I know that because of the contract, <laughs> but maybe stay home for a year. Get yourself into shape, refresh your blood, come up with some ideas. Because him keeping himself on TV and just trying to evolve into some other stupid character, how many times does this have to fail in a row before Tony will acknowledge that he needs to have a tough conversation with Chris Jericho? Everyone else in that company knows what's up. But Jericho will keep doing it, and you know when this bombs, he'll come up with some other stupid character. And he'll have a flunky who acts like a fool like him, putting him over. It's the same thing over and over again. It just... Terribly uncreative. He he was someone when he came there, but then he's been six different people since then. Anyway, and and there's more of this through the show. The problem is it's all throughout the show, and, and it got worse and worse. But this is the attempt to get past the fans chanting, please retire, Adam. This is him leaning into that. And I don't know how this leans into that, but this is him (laughs) leaning into that and trying to make it work for his new character. The fans telling him to stay home. They don't want this. I'm not sure sure he's leaning into it as much as pissing in the wind. It's one thing to be a heel, but it's another thing to like try to be a heel with go home heat. Like, that's what the attempt, it's like, how much could I do to get people to turn the channel? That's what it feels like. Really, really bad. This is some of the worst work of Chris Jericho's career. And that's saying something. That's saying a lot. And it's, 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 it's sad. It's sad. And poor Big Bill, he was finally showing some potential with Ricky Starks. And now here he is. Who convinced Big Bill? This will be great for you. You'll finally get to show people you have a personality. You'll get to do some comedy. Who tried to convince Big Bill or did convince Big Bill, Chris Jericho, that this was a good idea? Because this is horrible. Oh, I think he knows it's not a good idea. I think he just knew not to say no to it. We'll find out. We'll find out if he goes to WWE. Because just like everyone else there, you know Big Bill wants to go back there. So we'll see if he signs a new deal because they believe in this character. Or we'll see what happens in the future. Where's Ricky Starks? That's all anyone's asking. And it ties into Big Bill who's been recreated. Ricky Starks off TV, more over than both of them. Well, speaking of... Nah, we can't really speak of people that are more over because Chris Daniels, who's already had his nuts cut off in, in five days after... He, he got to make an announcement, at least, on this program. Uh, that he announced that the match... That we're going to have right now is going to be a qualifier for the TNT title multi, multiple man ladder match at Forbidden Door. And then they bring out Mark Briscoe versus Brian Cage. And I must admit, I, I can't skip Mark Briscoe even for Brian Cage. As bad as I don't want to see Brian Cage, I still want to see Mark Briscoe. And I will say that on, especially now, on this roster of indie guys and guys not ready for television and Japanese and lucha cast-offs and high-priced popcorn farts, but any wrestling promotion that's not using Mark Briscoe as a main event guy, it's ridiculous. And I don't know what the fuck anybody's not registering about that and they had their chance on a number of occasions of and cage you could probably produce him and make him a hell of a bodyguard stooge big partner whatever the fuck if he listens if he's producible but he his matches suck because he alone left to his own devices is an indie-minded guy 
And so he comes off like an idiot. Because he's so big and the way he moves and tries to do a lot of the athletic stuff, and he does it. I'm not saying tries. He does the athletic stuff. It's almost more like a male cheerleader than a wrestler at times. Yes. And if he's to the suplex off the ropes outside in, that's tremendous. And a few other, and give him some power moves and cut the fucking flips off and it, it teach him some psychology. And now that I'm thinking about it, just give him a brain transplant. But you know what I'm saying? But Mark is the star here. So Cage beat up Mark through most of the fucking match. And then finally, Mark won with the Froggy Bow, one, two, three, right result. And then Jungle Jackoff comes up on a screen and does a promo on him from the back or somewhere. And Mark Briscoe would eat Jungle Jack out of like a fucking cupcake. I'm sorry. But uh, again, Mark, even even after what happened with Jay, but at any point in the year and a half since then, if they'd given him a sustained presentation, I hate to use the word push anymore, nobody knows what it means anyway these days, but a sustained presentation and tried to get him over, involved him in things that got him over, and instead of playing hide-and-seek with him and beating him enough that then that's where the people knew he was. What the fuck? He's different, and he can work, and he's talented, and the people are naturally predisposed to like him to begin with. So you fucking morons. All right. And that was just a qualifier for the latter match. Yes. Which obviously Jungle Boy will be in, because they've already teased his involvement, so... And it's another match I'm not going to be excited about. Just too many multi-man matches for no good reason. We already started the show with one, with four people, and now this is just building to another ladder match for a title. It's just, eh. I'm sick of everything with AEW. I'm sick. I'm so what? sick of Tony Khan's bad booking. Let me... That I'm let punching me... my hand. That, I mean, that's fuck. Well, well, now I've, I've got sympathy for you. You're punching your hand. Punch yourself in the face. I'm not a fool. Get get mad enough to just clock yourself right in the fucking nose. I'll wait. Ding, 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 ding. All right, let me skip through a few of these things because now we just we just went through insanity coming up on nine o'clock. I can't believe that they came up at the top of the hour like this. We had let's do it all in one clump. Renee Moxley good in the back with Joe and Hook. And before they can speak, a bunch of jobbers came in, and I've forgotten who the fuck they are. I can't remember their goddamn names. One of them was Tony the, Nice, I think. Tony Nice, there you go. That was one of them. And I think because the shot was horrible, also, but the fucking fake lawyer that used to do the fake shit, Mark was Sterling. In there. there you go. But they came these job. Not even jobbers. We haven't seen them in so fucking long. They're nobodies. These nobody jobbers came in and bowed up to verbally to Hook and Samoa Joe. And then Joe has to restrain Hook and, and maintain order. And he has to mention all the off-camera extra security that they've got around there as an explanation for why they didn't kill these fucking guys. Because Joe knew that it was goddamn embarrassing. That he didn't just blow his breath on these fucking morons and they all wilt. And then we had more of Jericho doing whatever the fuck he's doing with Mac Daddy and Cool Hand Luke. And that was a couple minutes of... Uh, eh. And then, right before 9 o'clock... Would they? We go to the acclaimed and Billy Gunn entrance, and Caster is starting a rap. And all of a sudden, there's the Lollipop Guild, Maddie and Nikki, on the fucking screen. Cut the music, telling them to cut his music. Cut the rap off. The acclaimed Billy Gunn, you guys haven't been respectful to us. You got to leave. Your segment is cut. Get the fuck out of our building. And they turn around and go. They actually turned around and left. And that was 
So not only are they neutered, but what the fuck? Now we've got a backstage fucking thing with jobbers and a backstage thing with a pain in the ass. And then the people don't get the rap and the baby faces they want to get. And then we go back to Renee with Swerve and Nana trying to promote his match tonight with Roddy. And then right at the top of the nine o'clock hour, we get a video of Mercedes Moon. And not even Mercedes Moon in AEW or talking about her. It's it's all New Japan. Clips of her from New Japan. I know she hasn't wrestled here yet. But clips of her from New Japan. But it's all about her upcoming title versus title match with Stephanie Vacker. And we don't even know what the, or care what their her fucking title is. Because Mercedes has one of the two or three girls title belts that there are here. What the fuck? She's the TBS champion. Okay. She, then who's the AEW women's champion? Uh, Tony Storm. Okay. And who's Stephanie fucking Vacker? She is the New Japan Strong Women's Champion. Do they have a weak women's champion? <laughs> no, the, uh, I guess Strong is just the name of the championship. It's a, a special new kind of steel <sighs> that they're forging the championship belt in. The point of every one of these girls, what the fuck? How many girls we want to see with belts? How many guys we want to see with belts? There's too many belts everywhere. And Tony's saying he wants to introduce more. He wants to introduce a mixed tag team championship, which would be the biggest mistake. So anyway, that's the way they've built up to the nine o'clock hour. And then at nine o'clock, they give us an eight man tag team match with the plumber Moxley and Claudio and Brian Danielson reunited with their former teammate and all-around charisma vacuum Wheeler Yuta against four unknown masked guys from CMLL in Mexico. And by the way, they call it an eight-man tag team match. Why don't they call it a Quattro's match? Because they can't be a six-man tag match. It's got to be a trio's match. So what about the Quattro's? Quartet. A quartet match. There you go. So, who do, who do they think was going to watch this? I told you a few weeks ago, they're building up Forbidden Door. They're going to start introducing random wrestlers from Mexico and Japan on this show who have never been there before, and they'll just be thrown out there. All four of these guys are the same size, wearing masks, all come from the same well, fucking no. promotion. Volador Jr. wasn't wearing a mask. Oh, well, I missed him. In the crowd. Uh, they started with a sloppy eight way on the floor and in the ring. And then Brian Danielson and the guy in one of the furry masks started trading chops. And I said, yes, there would be comedy in me watching this and breaking it down. But life is too short. After 20 fucking minutes, you to beat someone. A and then... Well, give me your thoughts on this match, if you have any at all. Not too much I could add to it. It mm. was, uh, I don't know who this appealed to. It didn't appeal to me. For so a now, well, yeah, but they're, they're past 920, and they give us a video on Daniel Garcia, and I got to give it to them. They're trying. Because we say we, this needs to be more real life. Tell the real stories. Make the, the stars human, the baby faces, get the fans behind them, right? All of these things are good things that you should do. Except it's, they, they can't, they either pick guys that aren't ready, angle be ready, have no gimmick, don't look like stars, or pick the wrong material for them this was all about his sacrifices when he used to wrestle the indies for no money and had a car wreck and broke both his legs coming back from not getting paid from an outlaw show so 
That doesn't make your stars human and sympathetic. It makes these guys look like they're a bunch of fucking morons, doesn't it? Does it not? I mean, it made him look like someone who really wanted it and went for it. God damn, at some point, you grow up and get a fucking job, Junior. Or you meet Tony Khan and you never have to do that. That's the I dream. Mean, I, what if, boy doesn't grow up and dream of meeting Tony Khan? I can see overcoming the, the, the dramatic stories in athletics are overcoming an injury. A top prospect goes down. Will he ever compete again? And he rises to be better than he was before or is overcome some type of disability at birth or over some kind of underprivileged background or some kind of educational difficulty, but just be it a stupid outlaw wrestler until you accidentally run into a billionaire. I don't think qualifies as an inspirational fucking story. And Daniel Garcia again has no physique, no gimmick, no discernible personality, but at least they're trying with this video. And it may work with some of their audience who will accept him as a baby face, but if you really want him to get him to the next level, he's got to do two things, and they probably won't agree with this, but one, drop the dancing. Drop that. And secondly, he's got to add size. And you know, we just saw yes. Wheeler Yuta, and those two guys like, came in at the same time or around the same time, and obviously veterans there both latched onto either one of them and brought them into their camps to try to develop them. Garcia's further along than Yuta. And he looks more like a wrestler than Yuta. He's just got to put on a little bit more size. And again, no more of the dancing. I, I, I get their crowd pops for it, but it's like one of those things that prohibits new people from really getting into someone. Yes, or from you being taken seriously instead of just another fucking trained chimpanzee in the fucking circus, right? Uh, the, one of the stars of our show, the tightrope guy. All eyes are on you? No. You don't want to be that guy. Like, if they're trying to make him a baby face and give him a chance, you don't want to be the dancing guy. Orange Cassidy is the pockets guy for anyone who doesn't watch wrestling. And even some people do. You don't want to be the guy, oh, that dancing guy, the guy who does that dance? You don't want yeah. to be that. So that has to be dropped. Well, speaking of the dancing, Christian was back there genuflecting with his crowd to the buckaroos, and they were all blathering at each other in a phony and unconvincing manner. Uh, and then we moved on to, I can't believe that I'm saying this. At this point in time, at like 9 fucking 25 or whatever p.m., a long match between Soraya and Maria. Mariah, Soraya and Mariah. Well, you say Maria, I say Mariah. A I don't say Maria, I say Mariah. Well, I say Maria, you say Mariah. You should say Mariah. Come Come see, come saw. It's another one of those. We don't know what kind of come it is. It's co see, co saw, not come see. I thought it was come see, come saw. <laughs> That's the way Mama Cornette used to say it. No, she did not. Stop it. Yes, she did. <laughs> but she wasn't fluent in Italian. So I don't know. It, that was the way we always heard it down here. Come see, come saw. Did you have a pizza place in Louisville your entire life? Or was there a point where, like, it came into town for the first time? Uh, well, I was too young to to know whether or not uh, pizza was a thing that I would want to have until I, when I was probably nine. See, I mean, you know, remember, this predates most fast food chains when I was nine years old, right? Right. We had, we had Jerry's J-Boy Restaurant was the takeout place here in my little neck of the woods, and I don't know that I was had gone to a McDonald's till I was like, I went to Wendy's before I went to a McDonald's, I'm pretty sure. Because we got a Wendy's round about 73, I believe, and I was shocked because unlike the J-Boys from Jerry's, they didn't have buns in between the patties. And this would, took me a while to wrap my head around. But, uh, oh, pizza, uh, about my cousin Larry met through his business associates, a guy who owned the, the Mario's Pizza here in town. It was a local place, but it was named Mario's Pizza, but his name was actually Morris. He was Jewish. He wasn't Italian. 
but he figured Morris's pizza probably that wouldn't work. Wouldn't, wouldn't trap the fucking public, captivate their taste buds. So, and well, that was the first, you know, first time I really had pizza. Speaking of the public's taste buds, Soraya versus that, I Mariah. don't think they had. I don't think they had Domino's back then or any kind of. No, not then. Fast food pizza, you know, at that point. I just saw something the other day, like it's the 40th anniversary of the Happy Meal. And it's incredible as a kid who grew up with always having the Happy Meal to think there were kids who went to McDonald's before that. There was no Happy Meal. There was no drive through There was nothing. I can, I can almost remember when there was no McDonald's. Just almost. Well, I wish McDonald's' I could catchphrase is I'm loving it. Were you loving Mariah versus Soraya? I wish I could remember when there was no Soraya versus Maria. Uh, it was a long match. It was a horrible, sloppy, fake heat by the heels afterwards. And then the new Japanese girl, uh, Kamano Wanaleya. Hey, no. if you don't blame, don't blame me, blame Heyman. Whatever her fucking name was, made a save. Nina Shirakawa, the woman well, with the bosom. Yeah, and then she and Tony Storm jumps in the ring, and they start bumping boobs with each other and making pulling faces, as the folks in the UK say, at each other. And then, and then they're all three hugging and rubbing, and uh, I do what the fuck is going on here? Why is this Japanese girl acting like this with these over-the-top facials and gyrations and? What, we didn't even establish that they started a story they never finished and moved on to other shit. And where is Tony Storm in the middle of all this? She's an afterthought now. What the fuck is going on here? Listen, I've seen Mira Shirakawa. She can do whatever she wants. Oh God, I've I've never seen her wrestle, but well, I have seen there her. There you box. go. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Now, I don't know what they're doing. I think. Uh, you know, it could be Tony wants to come up with some outside-the-box ideas. Promoting his own lesbian porn is probably something no wrestling promoter has done to try to boost interest in their product. No, that, that is untrue. Heyman pulled that shit. Oh, I guess, well, and maybe, yeah, it, and maybe Misty Blue, now that I think of it. <laughs> he, well, he tried to do something on OVW. When he, when, the brief period of time he was booking OVW, I can't remember if it was with... It was with Aaron the Idol Stevens, and there was two of the girls. I don't can't remember who they were. It doesn't matter. The point is, Danny Davis told him to shut that shit down. You're not having three ways on local Louisville fucking television. And uh, so he had to adjust. He, he, he Toto, you're not in Philadelphia anymore. But anyway, and then besides, we're ready now for the AEW world title to be on the line after they have, I'm pretty sure, I don't know the ratings yet. You're going to tell me here shortly, but I'm pretty sure they've driven away every goddamn able-bodied human being in front of the television with what they've given them up till now, and now it's Roderick Strong and Swerve for the title. And I couldn't take any more. I didn't watch the match, but I'm here to report to you. Oh, come on. What is that? No, no, I, I'm sorry. Well, fuck it. it what the fuck? What's it going to be? Swerve's going to win. There's going to be chaos. It's going to overrun. I'm not going to see it. But they went. Here's how bad they are at formatting television. They went to the fucking break, their last commercial break, at a picture in picture at four minutes until 10. So, it, and you've got people, what? And God damn it. You get the people interested in this world title match, and it's almost 10 o'clock anyway. Point is, if people at the top of the hour are flipping by, they were barely back from break at 10 o'clock. And then they went over, and I don't know what the finish was, and I don't give a shit, besides the fact that Swerve didn't lose the title, because that wasn't going to happen. You didn't think Roderick Strong would win after the big confrontation with Tony Khan and Christopher Daniels? No, because after I've seen Roddy wearing those fucking... Pansy ass glasses of his, nerd glasses. It makes him look even further like a fucking nerd. I don't believe he can whip cream with an outboard motor, much less whip anybody in a wrestling match. Well, fucking on. nerd hold glasses. Hold on. Anymore. What makes them nerd glasses? That's not fair. Because they're goddamn plastic see through. It looked like some kind of goddamn environmental activist professor at a major university ought to be wearing them, not a goddamn wrestler. What about the mustache? It makes him look older. What do you think of the mustache? Do you think he should it keep it or makes should he shave him look it? it all makes him look older. He's blessed with incredible genetics and 
And he fucking does things to make himself look older. And nerdier. Well, if he was going to make some changes and get rid of the mustache, do you know someone he can call? Well, that's right. I'll tell you exactly who they can call, Brian. They can, well, I can tell you who they can call, but I can't tell you how they can call them because Harry's.com does not have a phone number here on this information here. You just, they, 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 they take everything at Harry's.com. So you can't really call them. You can contact them. You can go there. You can look at things. You can purchase things. You can communicate. But you doesn't got to call them on a telephone. That's, a, that's basically the situation here. Is that correct, Brian? That they is- don't have a phone number on this. Well, there's a website, which is what most people would do, and it's very easy to get your Harry's. Well, but maybe I want to call them up on the phone at 867-5309 and, and tell them that I want some of their fine products, the German-engineered razor blades that shave you slicker than whale shit in an ice flow, or maybe the ergonomically designed, handled five-blade razor it's so easy to, that you can just glide it across your cheeks and your chin. Nobody, if you're like Haman, any number of your chins. And it just moves smoothly. It's as slicker than cum on a gold tooth. Or maybe I want to order some of their foaming shave gel. That you could spray this stuff on an emergency exit on a Delta plane and slide right down it without giving yourself any road rash. I don't know if we should be uh, promising that as one of the things that it does. Well, just have one of these in your pocket when you're on the plane and and just just in case. And you get all these type of things for $3. You get this trial, uh, trial package, trial period. The trial package is what I'm talking about where you get the razor and the five blades and the shave gel and the travel cover. And that's only the trial package is what judge auto dealer was promising the women (laughs) at the mouse's ear. Yes. That's right. The trial package. See, Scott Cornish would have found that funny. God damn it. I I enjoyed it. The mouse's ear. The reference that a mouse's ear would have got him. Yes. Because well, that's because he would known where it was. Because the mouse's ear was a, a an adult entertainment establishment with naked ladies down there in Knoxville, Tennessee. But nevertheless, they don't have naked ladies at Harry's. But you could probably <laughs> shave a few. You could probably shave a few slicker than a good whistle. But folks, it's more and more or less fits for your for your face if you're a man with. With Bush more, and more hairiness. or less, actually more. Just it's for yeah, your face. More, more yes. yes. Specifically. With with bushy hairiness growing from your cheeks. But anyway, the thing is, normally this stuff costs a lot more. But if you do this, if you go to Harry's.com slash JCE, you can get the $13 trial set for just three dollars. And then if you like everything, which why in the world wouldn't you? Then you can sign up. They can deliver it each month. You can schedule your deliveries. You can change. You can cancel. You can you can write books about it. You're entirely free to do what you will with your normal daily life, no matter what decisions you make here at harrys.com. And you can smell like redwood and wildlands and stone. So as, as we mentioned before, if you have always aspired to smell like a tree or a rock go to harrys.com slash jce no, let's not put it that way if you want to smell good and get your face looking good if go you harry's. want to smell good and get your face buried in between two thighs of some italian porn star or something i mean it's happened it's happened before so it could happen to you It could happen to you, folks. Anything can happen at Harry's. And I'm just wild about Harry. And Harry's wild about you if you're a customer. Harry's.com slash JCE, folks, for for all of that. All of those things we mentioned. For all of that, and we're going to talk about uh, shaving. We'll continue to talk about it with these dynamite numbers. Yeah, how much did they shave off where they started this week? Well, before we get the dynamite, because it's an interesting story, and I think we need to address it here. This is the time. NXT. This past week, NXT, on the USA Network, this is according to WrestleNomics, 
768,000 viewers. Ew. They have got a young roster. They've got a lot of people trying to get their way up. The Rock's daughter looks so awkward on this show. I don't know why they're wasting their time with that. But they've lately... No, also, you, you know why they're wasting their time well, with Well, we that. all know why they're wasting their time with that. But they've introduced interesting elements recently. Jordan Grace, TNA uh, Knockouts Champion, I believe it is, is now appearing on the show making challenges. Ethan Page, someone who was on AEW TV. I thought he had some potential, and I also thought he was never used well, ever. I agree with the second part of that. He showed up and challenged Trick Williams for the championship, and that got people buzzing. And we talk about these AEW numbers and where they are, and we can't talk about playoff basketball. There's always something on TV, though. We've said they're catching up to NXT, but now we're seeing NXT's catching up to them. And they've got to show that people, people who are into NXT, and I'm not right now, but the people who are really buzzing about it, a lot more than people who are into AEW are buzzing about it. And let me ask you this. Do we have the information? You say 768,000. Do we have the quarters is what I'm asking on NXT? Yes, we do. Where did they start and where did they finish? How much of their audience did they retain? Oh, wow. I'm looking at these numbers now. A few, uh, without going through everything, 8 to 8.15 p.m. And once again, this is from WrestleNomics. They opened at 786 with 289 in the key demo. And they opened the show with Ethan Page, Robert Stone, Ava Angle, recap, uh, Jordan Grace versus Stevie Turner, and Roxanne Perez, and Trick Williams and Lash Legend Angle. Roxanne! Perez. So that's where they opened. The low point in the show, 8.45 to 9 p.m., Tony D'Angelo versus Damon Kemp with Picture in Picture, 7.14, 2.68 in the key demo. And then from there, I'll give you the numbers, 9 to 9, 15 p.m., 778 and 297, 9, 15 to 9, 30, 790, 307, 9, 30, 9, 45, 784, 314, and finally, and as an overrun, 778 with 321 in the key demo, 8-minute overrun, 807, 343 in the key demo. Okay, well, taking the overrun out, they ended up with uh, 8,000 people less, but 20, 32,000 more in the key demo at the end of the show than the beginning, and they never dropped below 700,000 in any of these quarters. And again, the first four quarters... It goes down, 786, 767, 731, 714, and then at 9 o'clock it picks up, and it it rises, and then it stays pretty steady the rest of the show. And we don't see but, that from AEW. But they're, they're an incredible pocket there, where at, at the most they lost, what, less than 10% of the goddamn audience. And ended up losing, what, a, 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 is that even 1%? I, I can't do math that minute. But that, that's uh, better than any other wrestling show that we have heard about. And again, they have a show with Buzz. They have an event coming up where these outsiders are going to be having their matches. And that's 768, AEW Dynamite this past week, Jim. Let's talk about these numbers. AEW Dynamite on TBS. June 5th, 2024, 8 to 10.06 p.m. These were compiled by WrestleNomics. The overall number, on average... 790,000 viewers. Oh, so they are up again very slightly. What was last week? It was 780-something, was Last week was 787. Okay, so there are 3,000 more people, but at least it's going in the right direction. But now the question is, what direction does this take from start to finish in comparison with the NXT program that we were just discussing? AEW Dynamite, June 5th, 2024, quarter 1, 8 to 8.15 p.m., the MJF Roosh live promo, and the Roderick Strong video, 976,000 viewers, 424 key demo. Oh, 
okay. Not only does this not bode well for the rest of the program after having heard the average, but they've got there nearly a million people. And and I, God, do we have the Big Bang lead in for this particular week? I do not know. I would be, and somebody out there, and and Thurston Howell, if you're listening, or anybody that's got the information, email it to Brian at what is our address? Corny drive through at gmail.com would probably be the easiest one. Okay, corny drive through at gmail.com. I wonder how many people they picked up that that over and above the Big Bang. Did people tune in for the anticipation of seeing MJF? Why is it suddenly bigger than it's been in quite some time? Was the Big Bang up, or did they get a tune-in factor on AEW? Uh, that, that would be interesting to know. And like I said the earlier, we heard a lot of feedback that people watched last week thinking MJF would be there. So whatever that number was, there's a large segment of it, or at least a segment of it, that were people expecting MJF that never got him. So the point is, as we talked about way earlier in the program, now that they've got him, or they got him, right out of the gate, 9 o'clock, this was going to be the highest quarter rated quarter hour of the show, because it always is. So it's not, it's not like I'm making an inflammatory statement. It's factually correct. So we don't know whether he drew him to it, but did after they'd seen him and knew they probably weren't going to see him again, did they stick around? Well, we got a quarter two, 8.15, 8.30 p.m. Jay Lethal versus Orange Cassidy versus Kyle O'Reilly versus Ray Phoenix with Picture in Picture and the post-match with Don Callis, Trent Beretta, Chris Statlander, Stokely Hathaway, and Willow Nightingale, plus Chris Jericho, Brian Keith, and Big Bill start walking around. 835,000 viewers. Oh! 141,000 people said to see you later. And we always say the second quarter is the best real barometer of what the first quarter would be without the one minute over on a big bang theory. I believe that would still put the second quarter above most weeks, second quarter in a long time. So oh, yeah, they, they didn't uh, for a few weeks. They didn't do an 800 and some thousand quarter. Well, we go to quarter three, 830 to 845 p.m. An ad break. Willow Nightingale's promo, Christopher Daniels ramp promo and the start of Mark Briscoe versus Brian Cage with picture in picture. 754,000 viewers. Okay, well, uh, they remedied that problem I just mentioned. Uh, that, <laughs> <laughs> he said, fuck it, we need to shed another 35, uh, 79,000 people to get us comfortably under the 800,000 mark. Uh, they're almost to the point now where they have to fluctuate a little bit and go back up just to hit their average, don't they? Well, we shall see. We go now to quarter four, 8.45 to 9 p.m. The continuation of Cage versus Briscoe. The Jack Perry promo. Samoa Joe and Hook's confrontation with the premier athletes. An ad break. More Jericho nonsense. <laughs> the Young Bucks cut off the acclaimed. Where was Tony Khan? And Swerve Strickland's backstage promo. 761,000 viewers. Oh, yeah, well, they're treading while well, they got 7,000 back. So they're, they're paddling upstream at this point. We go now to the big 9 o'clock hour, quarter 5, 9 to 9, 15 p.m. The mercedes Monet stephanie Vacour video and the start of Esfinge Magnus. <laughs> if that is how you pronounce it. What is his name? Esfinge, E-S-F-I-N-G-E. Esfinge, I guess if you wanted to make it like Jack A. Esfinge, Magnus, Rugido, and Volador Jr., I remember his dad, versus the Blackpool Combat Club, with picture in picture, 780,000 viewers. So they picked up 19,000 at the top of the hour. But now that I've said that, and I'm looking at that, it's time for him to start shedding 
because hell, they've still got to make their overall average. They got to go down from here. Just think what your reaction would be if you watched this match. Quarter six, nine fifteen, and nine thirty p.m. The continuation of Esfinge, <sighs> Magnus, Rugido, and Volador Jr. versus the BCC. More Jericho bullshit. The Daniel Garcia video. The Young Bucks acclaimed gun backstage angle. An ad break. The Young Bucks and Christian and his pals backstage angle, and the start of Mariah versus Soraya. Seven hundred and fourteen thousand viewers. I mean, they're lucky to get that because that match was long. And then look what you just read off. That followed it. That followed it. Yeah, and I don't see a lot of fucking bright spots coming up. Well. Quarter 7, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m., the continuation of Mariah vs. Soraya, the post-match with Tony Storm, and Mina Shirakawa, more Jericho nonsense backstage, this time with Private Party, an ad break, and Brian Danielson's backstage promo, 731,000 viewers. Again, I gotta hand it to him there to pick up 17,000 people on... What they had just done there. The girls uh, kill this rating every week. They pick people up from the BCC versus the Luchadors. What does that say? Uh, well, we go now, Jim, to quarter eight. I remind you, there's a six-minute overrun. Quarter eight, 9.45 to 10 p.m. The AEW World Champion Swerve Strickland versus Roderick Strong with picture-in-picture. 768,000 viewers. Now, that's that's surprising. 362 in the key demo. Overrun, 792. So Tuning in they, for Modern Family. Yes. They got another 37,000 people for that main event, which is surprising since... I mean, I know Swerve's popular, but, I mean, you know, the way it was presented, etc. So I must applaud them for that. And they figured out a way not to fucking go into 600,000 territory anymore, which uh, they did several weeks in a row there on some of these segments. But I think we, we I, I'm not saying that MJF was responsible for 976,000 people at the start because it's always the highest rated segment. But when you immediately lose 140 and then lose another 80 on top of that, and then it's kind of steady from there on with almost no fluctuation. It kind of means they got MJF and they knew they weren't going to get any more of it, doesn't it? I think there are people that probably just tuned in for MJF. If you're a fan of Will Ospreay, who's been featured as a star on this show, he wasn't there. We know already, we've seen what happens. The Bucks drive people away. The women's division drives people away. Jericho and this awful shit is about to drive a lot of people away, even more than he already has. But Swerve has in the past been a ratings mover, maybe more significantly than now because they've killed him with the booking, even though he's the world champion. But Swerve is someone the fans took to, MJF, and Osprey. And I think they're going to have to sprinkle those three guys yeah. throughout the show to try to hold this rating. Sprinkle is right. More like a golden shower. Jesus Christ. That's the, the, the problem that they've got themselves in through attrition and bad management and all the other problems that we've documented is that they've got tons of guys on the roster and very few mean anything. And the ones that used to, we've seen, we've seen, we've seen their shit. Moxley, seen his shit. Jericho, seen his shit. Danielson, what is his shit anymore? It, some guys were big fucking names, and, and now it's just, eh. And, uh, I would go ahead. Do you think Tony's going to have an epic meltdown if NXT starts beating them in the ratings? Well, they'll figure out some way to work it out in the the in the demo of South Polynesian lesbian nuns, they're way ahead or whatever, but it ain't going to help his fragile mental state, Tony's I'm talking about. And they were 22,000 off here. So son of a gun. But the problem is the other program 
kept almost every single bit of their audience all the way through it, while his bled what they got at the start into where that their average was what it was. <sighs> well, Jim, perhaps you work at the network and you've been promised a certain number that doesn't come in. Perhaps things keep going down and you're not getting straight answers as to what's happening. It's not WCW. You can't just get rid of the company. But you could sue. Yeah, I could sue you for that transition. I suck today. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, you say you're sorry. I didn't ask for a character reference. But I'll tell you who will ask for a character reference on anybody that wrongs you, wrongfully terminates you, damages you, injures you, runs over you in a bread truck, or in some other way commits a public nuisance and is a menace to society, and that's the crusading attorney that has the safety of the American public uppermost in his mind, and that is this man. Call Stephen P. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, he is a man who cares about the health and the welfare and the well-being of the American people and the fairness and justice with which they are treated, and that's why he will fuck a motherfucker up in courtroom. He'll give anybody one chance to do the right thing, and then he will make them wish that they had never been born. He will make your opponents in court when he represents you curse their mothers for the day that they were given birth to rather than come into a courtroom and face this Godzilla of a son of a coal miner who is now a crusading attorney for truth, justice, the American way, and a big fucking settlement. And that's Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 877-50-STEVE is the number to call to get a man on your side that could have talked Nixon out of Watergate. That's right. I mean, he could have. I don't know if he would have. I don't know if he would want that. Well, he could have. He just chose not to. Because he was only six years old at the time also. So there was that. They wouldn't listen. You know, he tried to tell people. He was actually on the other side. He tried to sound the alarm that Nixon was evil and corrupt, but they wouldn't listen to him because he was six years old. Well, Stephen P. New, I don't know what else to say. 877-50-STEVE. Jim, before we wrap things up and back to normal stuff next week, I know I've said that a lot, but I've had a crazy week, and Jim has as well. Any thoughts on Pat Sajak retiring from Wheel of Fortune? You know, I could never give two shits about that television program. I hated... To see old uh, old Alex go from Jeopardy, because I like Jeopardy, but that the Wheel of I don't like the contestants on Wheel of Fortune. I, it takes no talent to play the fucking game. You're just guessing shit and spinning a fucking wheel. There's no goddamn art to it. I don't care who that Vanna White. What is she now? Seventy? How much surgery has she had? If she had a fucking facelift all at once, they'd have had enough left over to make a midget. I don't think she's 70. She hasn't had that much surgery. We leave her alone. What did she do to you? I used to, I used to pleasure myself to pictures of her in magazines. Oh! Old, I am. There's a vision no one needs. Well, I'm telling you, she's, at, she's older than me. You're not modulating enough right now. We need to get you somehow more modulated right now. No, I'll modulate. You, I, that's what I was doing. I was modulating myself, looking at pictures of her and Maya. Google her or Google yourself. No, my, my dad had the or Playboy with your her chicken. when I was a kid. I, I've seen it. And, but, but look her up. And, and how, how old is she? The point is, they're all too old. I need to get off the whole show. I don't care whether Wheel of Fortune exists or not. It's not Je Jeopardy is where the smart, witty, funny, 67. happy, peppy people. See, she's 70 almost. 67, not 70. Okay, okay, she comes up to you at a bar. Is 67 going to make the deal, nullify the deal breaker if she was 70 or is it close enough? 
If some old lady comes up to me in a bar to pick me up, I'm going to tell her to get out of there. 67 or yeah, something well, doesn't matter. Yeah, well, there you what go. You... Okay, now imagine if that fucking 70-year-old or 67, and now imagine she's 38. Now, see, now That's we're a in a different, different person. Earth. I don't even understand how this works, this equation yeah. you're putting together. Yeah, well, it's the same person. Can I buy a vowel? No, you can't. You have to you have to just blurt it out right there. Well, F's not a vowel, but F you. <laughs> so the point is I don't care about their program. And I think she's entirely too old to be parading her her attributes around her. She's showing skin, her legs, for she heaven's it, sake. She wears like an evening gown. And she? her her varicose veins look like a roadmap of the Rocky Mountains. Oh, stop. You don't even watch the show, you said. I don't know why I'm defending the show. My well, grandparents I've seen like pictures it. of her in a magazine lately. Lately? Oh, you're still, yeah. still doing what you used to do, I see. Well, see, there you see she, but now she's in the goddamn Sears Roebuck mail order catalog. The question was about Pat Sajak. I don't know what made you decide to tear into well, poor old Vanna White. Vanna White. All she had to do was fucking be... They said... They asked her one time in an interview. <laughs> they said to people say that you're, you know, you don't have to be too too smart to do your job. And they, well, I have to know the letters. No, they light up. You just have to be able to distinguish <laughs> light from darkness. <laughs> Fucking illiterate boob. Oh, stop it. She's not illiterate. Yeah. She knows the letters. Well, she knows the lights. Look at the pretty lights. I wish Pat J Sajak or Jaysack or whatever his name is all, <laughs> all the best in his future endeavors. Oh, all right. That didn't go the way I thought it would. Have you seen The Price is Right at all lately? We'll talk about game shows real quick before we wrap no, things up. No, no, no. Since uh, As long as Bob Barker is gone, there's no reason to do that either. Besides, I don't know what the price of anything is these days anymore. It's, it's, it's crazy. They have a primetime version, too. I watched it recently with my kids, and I don't know. It's like too flat. I don't know. It looks like NXT almost. Too much light everywhere. Well, yeah, but the thing in the old days, back in my day, the price is right. The price of everything that they could possibly fit in the studio was between a dollar and five hundred dollars. So you couldn't be far off anyway. A goddamn new car is five hundred dollars. Can of goddamn sardines, it's a dollar. You're pretty close. Now it's all over the fucking place. As is this show. So I guess we'll wrap it up there with that. It's your show. I'm just talking until you cut it off. So good luck, Pat Sajak, in your future endeavors. And uh, we'll see what Jim thinks of the new host of Wheel of Fortune. Maybe they'll find out. I'm way not going to be watching it now either. I didn't watch Pat. I'm not going to watch his, his newest fucking replacement. I don't care whether it's Tom or Dick. I might watch Harry. He's a sponsor of ours. He's a sponsor. Well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back on the Jim Cornette Experience with a review of Who Killed WCW, SmackDown, and who knows whatever else we're going to have, but lots more. I have, I, have, I have many problems with many people we're going to talk about in the, the hierarchy of WCW. And we'll be back here next week with more on the drive through Listener questions next week here on the show. Guess the program. We're going to try to do next week here on the show. Oh, you lie. Go through the archive, 605pod.com. That's my archive. Go through the archive of this show, the uh, Cult of Cornette. What am I saying? Patreon.com slash Cornette. $5 a month gets you access to the archive. Going back to 2013, Patreon.com slash Cornette. Follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. Follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. YouTube, go to YouTube and look for the official Jim Cornette channel and all the Travis Eckle artwork. Subscribe today, the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. The show is sponsored by Stephen P. New, 888 50 Steve. No. You just 877 877 50 Steve. Get even with Stephen for this spot at newlawoffice.com. But until the experience, and next week back here on the drive through for Jim Cornette. I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho! Tip-top! <laughs>